Now, remember, this is 100% live, so this is unplanned. You never know what you're going to find on a live safari. My name is Brent Yeosmith, and for the first time in about six months, I'm reunited with the Wildebeest. Uh, so very exciting to be back on Drive with Wilde. And, of course, we have some very, very special Safari Live fans that, well, that are in final control. So... A big hello to them, and I'm sure a lot of you know who they are. Hashtag Safari Live, if you can guess which Safari Live fans are sitting in final control right now. Remember, if you can send us questions as well, once you've finished guessing uh, on the hashtag Safari Live uh, as well, just pop it on any of the feeds that you might be watching on. So I'm trying to get towards Hosanna. Uh, the young male leopard who we left at the end of drive quite close to here this morning But this Eddie is a little bit close to the road for me to go shooting past him and I'm just trying to see if it is the same big must bull we saw this morning Now a little clue to which Safari Live viewers are sitting in final control. They might be on Safari at Chitwa Chitwa and they might have my little brother as their Safari Guide. Even the elephant's listening. He started keeping still. I'm just trying to try and maneuver us into a slightly better position uh, without getting too close to him. Uh, ooh, but he's obviously chosen the most difficult spot for us to get around. Oh, watch out, there we go. Oh, this looks like he might be having a snooze against that tree. He looks like he's been here all day. And it's not, is it the must ball? What do you do? He was, look at that, he's resting his face on that branch. Now, what is he doing, actually? I can't really see what he's doing. But he's being... Oh, dear. Okay, and uh, uh, VMP, that's... So, it looks like he's actually... Um... So, guys, this is quite a, a possibly dangerous situation, so I'm just going to move the car into a, a place that I can escape if I need to be. It looks like he's quite badly injured. Um, from it looks like... The size of that injury, it looks like he tangled with another big elephant. And uh, a t it looks like a tusk puncture. Something has pulled out a lot of his insides. So this is quite a serious injury. And that's why he was probably trying to rest his head up on that, on that tree. Okay. So, shame, boy. Now we can't really see what's going on on the other side, um, but that looks very, very serious from this side. Uh, he's not showing any or displaying any aggression at all towards us um, at the moment, but you can see him leaning against that tree uh, to try to take the weight off the, his injured left side. Shame, big guy. Now, male elephants, when they do fight, can, it can be very, very serious. And it looks like he's probably been injured by a, a big tusk, and it's pulled through. Now, animals, of course, are incredibly resilient, and they can sometimes come back from what we consider to be absolutely horrific injuries. So what I need to do now is I need to get hold of the Sabi Sands quickly. Um, just because an injured male elephant like this uh, can be a potential uh, threat to people on safari and if he gets close to safari lodges. So we just need to inform someone. And uh, I'm going to do that quickly. While we do that, let's go across to Taylor so she can say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari again. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me 
I'm very lucky, is David. I just wanted to make it awkward for him. Right, now as most of you know, you can chat to us and ask us all sorts of questions. All you have to do is hashtag Safari Live and uh, you can talk to us via the YouTube chat too. Very sad about that elephant. Now, like Brain said, it can be quite dangerous, especially if we are around doing bushwalks. That is an animal you do not want to bump into. Now, are we ready? We're heading to the Birmingham boys that we had this morning, well that Brent got this morning. And then we revisited a little bit later on in the drive. So that's where we're going now. I suspect they're going to be flat still, but we'll have a little look at them and then maybe go and look for something else and come back a bit later. So, for all of you diehard Safari Live fans out there, you know you can come and visit us, right? You come to the Sabi Sands, you come and stay around, you come and see us. And well, we've got Matt and Lisa sitting in final control today having a little watch and uh, I just wanted to make a public announcement thank you very much for the chocolates and the apple juice and the coffee we're very excited to have you with us we wish you, with us. We wish you could stay longer so actually I have, a, I have a question then for Matt and Lisa sitting in final control do you have any questions for us how cool is that instead of having to type away you can just ask a question. Oh, there's actually, David, hold on tight. But have they already drank? There's a whole herd of elephants that have just gone past the dam cam. You may have seen them. I didn't see them. I didn't know they were there, but we'll try and catch up to them. I think there's a sneaky road down here. An old two track that I used when I, we had Hukumuri. Excuse me, Impala, coming through. <clears throat> Hello, Impala, making all sorts of strange noises. Um, oh no, you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna be so sneaky. I know exactly where they're gonna come out. They're gonna go feed in this thicket. So we shall reposition quickly. Sorry, everybody. We'll try and get a view of the elephants, but they're going down, basically past the lodges now, past Boyotella. And as we drive along though, speaking of elephant bulls and musts, and Brent had obviously an interesting sighting this morning. Megan, you've asked, um, how exactly do elephants come into mass? Well, they just start producing a lot of uh, testosterone um, at certain times of uh, the year and at a certain age. Is that, again, there's a lot of factors that um, will determine when an elephant bull comes into mast. But essentially what's going on is that there, there's an overload of testosterone being produced, being re not reproduced, being produced in their bodies. And um, it basically causes them to go a bit wild. They become very excited and all they want to do is chase after the females. They basically have blinkers on and they don't even acknowledge anyone else around them unless you drive behind the elephant bull and mass them and sort of bother them. Then they're going to turn around and go, well, I told you I didn't want you to drive right behind me. So I think before we get to these lions, we're going to try and anticipate. Wait, hold on, everybody. That's a bumpy section of the road. We're going to try and and then hopefully we'll get to see them because there were quite a few of them. Some of you may have been watching on the on the dam cam, in fact. Uh, there's a massive animal pathway that runs in line with the the rooms of Vuyatella and come all the way. It comes all the way up here. The thing is, is that I don't like to off road for elephants because I think it's dangerous. Because if something goes wrong, you can't really get out very quickly. At least if we've got the rows and things. So we are, that's the plan, and um, we just wait for them. And here's a particularly thick area. So I think there seem to be a few bulls and must around on the property that could have been bothering these breeding herds. So we don't want to bother them anymore. Just having a look. Actually, what we might do is I might just pull off here and we'll stop and listen quickly. Maybe we can hear them. That's what I'm going to do. I feel like these elephants are tiptoeing through the bush. Hmm. Now I can't hear any cracking of branches just yet. Are they still down at the dam? Did they maybe turn around and go towards we tell a dam itself anyways I don't know it doesn't 
doesn't sound like anybody's been able to spot them. They've gone sort of further north. Okay, well, we'll just wait patiently. There's only a couple of uh, animal pathways that I think that they would use. They will get them eventually. Tristan is going to be on bushwalk for a little bit, so off you go and join him. We are indeed, we are going to be on bushwalk and that is why we are a little bit tardy this afternoon. So as Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera I've got a Craig, aka the Batman, and we're hopefully going to have a wonderful afternoon. It's a warm, very, very hot day, and so it should be good conditions for walk. We should have a few insects around, hopefully moving about, maybe even some butterflies. I've already seen a couple monarchs floating about, so we'll maybe see if we can concentrate on some butterflies. And anything else that comes our way, we're going to try and see if we can go. And, and the reason why we, like, I say on foot is because Jigger has a problem where it overheats a little bit and so the sound then goes and so we're waiting for Jigger to cool down so we'll jump into Jigger a little bit later when it gets a little cooler but for now we're going to be on foot. I did have some audio for some elephants not too far away very close sounds like actually just at the dam itself so maybe what we're going to do is try and head down that section and see if we can find those ellies and have a little look at them on foot and then otherwise anything else we can see. Now while we try and get everything sorted out and try and get ourselves down to that area let's send you back across to Brent and see where he is and what his plans are so far now that he's left that elephant. Hey guys I'm just warning everyone this this is not the nicest view around so if you are sensitive you might not want to look. So uh, I've reported, I'm just waiting for a call back um, from the wardens and stuff. And you can see there quite obviously that it's a tusk wound from another elephant. So it, is, it isn't from human beings. But um, you can see the wound is quite serious. And you can just see that from his behavior. Now, uh, you can see there's even a stick stuck in there. So, I mean, this looks relatively recent within the, within the last couple of days. And... Uh, shame he must be in so much pain so it'll be up to the sabi sands to decide what to do i've just got to wait here to uh till i hear back from them and if they need gps coordinates and things like that oh, it, is, it does look quite bad shame and he's showing no sign of aggression or anything like that he's just resting up against this uh, weeping wattle tree So he keeps throwing sand on the wound and what he's doing there is trying to keep the flies off it. Now of course that injury is quite bad but he, he doesn't look too weak just yet. So the predators are possibly could take advantage of this and that's what Matt's wondering. Uh, will, will lions take advantage of this elephant? There is a strong possibility, depending on how weak he is. Hyenas as well would definitely... I've seen hyenas harass injured ellies before, uh, for up to two days before actually managing to kill the elephant. So it is one of those difficult things. But that is nature, and that's how nature plays out day after day. Uh, when we're not watching, so one must remember that. that we are observers here, and we're not here to interfere. Romit, it's such a difficult question you're asking, Romit, about if the animal is endangered, will they interfere? You saw what happened with that wild dog. Um, they didn't interfere. So if the injury is deemed to be caused by human beings by some way, then the vets will sometimes interfere and uh, try heal it. Um, but most of the time in these situations, uh, nothing will happen. The, uh, if they do decide to interfere with this elephant, it's, it's it's difficult to say what will happen, but they just need to know about it because it is a potential uh, safety risk to all of us out here. I mean, bushwalks and other game drive vehicles. Um, and if he wanders close to camps and he's injured and trying to get water or food. So that's why I've notified people he is a potential safety risk. Um, I wonder if it was that must bull we saw this morning. That That is something a big must bull like that might do to a, a younger bull like this. 
while in must, not necessarily when they're out of must, but when in must, that is something that massive must ball we had on the Sunrise Safari might do. Now, Ronda's asking about the age of this Eddie. He's old. Uh, he's not. He's not a very old bull. I'd say he's probably around thirty. So he is an adult. Um, oh shame! Here. He's throwing dirt on that wound again. And it's quite bad. You can actually see there's a little. It looks like an acacia stick that's got actually stuck in some of the tattered flesh there. So, as I say, it's quite fresh, and at the moment he might not be a problem, but if infection sets in, he could become a very dangerous animal here. So, uh, whether the, the ch choice is made to leave him, um, or euthanize, or treat, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to make those decisions. And uh, we've had quite a close look at the injury, and Bobby's wondering, is it just skin or intestines? It actually looks to be pieces of intestine, Bobby. Um, so when we first saw him hiding behind the tree, I just thought he was having a snooze. And as we moved around, I could actually, I just got that smell of stomach. So it, the, the chances of it getting infected are very, very high. Especially since it's dangling like that, if he moves through the bush, it could get tangled on, on stuff, as you've seen there. I'm just going to move a little bit forward. Shame, big boy. Okay, there we go. Now, as I said, the, what happens to him, uh, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to make those decisions. But uh, JK is asking if he's euthanized, um, would he be euthanized if he passed? There's uh, a danger towards the safari vehicles and stuff like that. Again, it's not, not my place to answer those questions, JK, but I think. Um, uh, a careful decision will be made. Oh, it looks like there's just a fresh bout of blood coming out now. Something moved. Uh, you can on the back right side. It's a. I just suddenly saw a little gush of blood coming out. There we go. And as I said, if you are sensitive, this is not for you. Um, we we're not going to be here the whole afternoon. I'm just waiting to hear back from um, the authorities. And as soon as I've heard back from them, I will be leaving. Um, I just need to know whether they need GPS locations and things like that. It doesn't look like he's going to move anyway. It looks like he's been here for quite a long time. Now... Of course, seeing stuff like this is difficult, and Emma is asking, does it ever get easier? Emma, I should hope not. I mean, uh, to a degree, we are immune to certain things. Uh, well, more immune than people who don't deal with it on a daily basis. But it's never nice to see anything suffering, um, animal or human. So if you get too used to it, I'd say there's probably something wrong with you. So he's just been moving around this tree throughout the whole day. I can see from the tracks he's flattened the area. Um, and he just can't seem to get comfortable. And you can just see how he's been there kicking up the dirt, spraying the dust on that wound. Oh, sorry. Um, I need to answer the phone quickly, so...
Next, if you need to link away, can you please do it? Okay, cross to Taylor. Hello. Hello again, everybody. We got our elephants out, I think it was fantastic, by the way. It was really quite nice. I've been searching for a herd of elephants for I cannot tell you how long, most of you know. Sorry I didn't get to share it with all of you. Uh, I'm trying to think what we're going to do now. It was very cute. There was a tiny little baby, but maybe some of you were lucky enough to get to see it on the dam cam. Um, I'm not going to go to the Birmingham males because I know they're going to be fast asleep, so we'll probably come back a bit later. And I suppose we'll just drive around and see what we can find, maybe do some birding. So that's going to be the plan for now. Maybe we'll head on over to Chitwa. We'll have a little look a bit later. Mm. Actually, let's go this way because there's some nice mud wallows down here. Actually, we'll go around here. So I, don't, I don't know, we're going to just try to find some more elephants because I'd like to spend a bit of time with them as I haven't spent much time with them at all. Just that nice bull that decided to stay for like two seconds this morning, have a, had a quick mud bath and then continued chasing after that young cow and calf that were there before him. Speaking of elephants, roadblock. Right, where is the road that I'm looking for? Hopefully we'll be able to find some elephants and then we can have lots and lots and lots of chats about them. But uh, seeing though we're just doing a DNC at the moment, Jason, you've asked how long does must last with elephants? Um, it depends. Again, some, it can last for up to two weeks. Some it might last a week. I suppose it just depends on their, their age and sort of social status, perhaps if they're a very big strong bull that's in prime condition it can last for a little bit longer than others some Something around a week or two i thought i saw leopard tracks it wasn't a leopard track in fact it was just a hyena footprint ski hyena there's some mud wallows down the Oh, sorry everyone. I'm eating ice. <laughs> it's very hot. Just under 100 Fahrenheit. So, we're busy still formulating a plan. Um, I'm just waiting for another phone call. Um, should be, I hopefully won't be here longer than another 10 or 15 minutes um, while we get the right people on the way. So, as I said, the, the biggest danger with this Ellie is not now, uh, while it's quite fresh still, um, it's in a day or two when it gets in, in if it gets infected with with intestines and stuff it probably will um, He could become very aggressive and uh, take it out on all sorts of things uh, including vehicles bushwalks lodges um, housekeeping ladies while they're collecting um, stuff like that So at the moment he is nice and relaxed, but he is a, a potential danger uh, down the road a little bit Oh, now, Ludmila was asking, is there any chance that Ellie could have got better? And I was sort of umming and ahhing, but then he defecated and uh, his dung came out runny and full of blood. So, you see there, Vyampi. So, it wasn't the normal blop, blop that you hear from an elephant. It... It, it, yeah, so it, it just sort of shot out, and I could see specks of blood in it, which, as I say, is not a good sign. That means he's he's wounded quite badly somewhere in the digestive tract. So th there's, <laughs> if I if I'm honest with everyone here, there's there's very very little chance of survival for this elephant. Um, and so that wound probably happened last night or yesterday. Um, although it's very difficult to tell, especially with these Eddie Bulls, because they keep throwing dust all over the wounds. So 
A shame, big boy. Now, unfortunately, this is one of those realities about living out in the bush. That sometimes it isn't all strawberries and cream. Now, if we, we take a positive from this elephant dying, this elephant has died, will die from a natural cause and a wound from fighting with another elephant bull. Uh, Coast Rinder is asking what animals will eat it. Now, that's the positive that if this elephant does die, it does provide a huge amount of um, food and nutrition back to the bush. I've seen lions, hyenas, I've even seen leopard feed off dead elephant. Um, but mostly it'll be lions and hyenas, and apart from that, um, apart from the lions and hyenas, um, the beetles, the, the, the carrion beetles, the scarab beetles, the dung beetles, um, flies, maggots, a whole host of other insects. So, I mean, it's his, his legacy will be putting back to the earth in terms of nutrients and, and food for other animals. So at the moment he's trying not to move too much but he can't help himself um sorry guys i need to take the call so, so now. hello Okay, so, um, Nikki, are we still having tech problems with the other vehicles? Um, so I do need to be on the phone for quite a bit. Okay, it sounds like Taylor has moved out of, or uh, well fixed her gremlins or moved into a good signal area. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappear for a little bit to try sort out everything about this elephant and hopefully we'll be back a little bit later with Hosanna. Well, we'll see how long our signal lasts for as we are heading to some other areas now. So I'm just showing these guys that I'm live and I can't stop and have a chat. Um... I'm sure they're going to go and look for Hosanna, but I'm not going to go and look for Hosanna now because I know that Brent would like to look for Hosanna. So we shall go down this way. We're just going to drive up and down on some roads with lots of mud wallows and hopefully find the elephants because that's what I'd like to do. I think it's going to be too hot for the cats to be doing anything right now. I mean, the weather was 36 degrees Celsius. It's warm. It doesn't actually feel that hot. Eh? It's warm, but it's not, not too bad. Nice with a breeze, gentle breeze still continuing from this morning, so that's quite nice and refreshing. That's why we want to keep on the go or stop in the shade. We don't want to be stopping in the, in the sun at all, not on a day like today. There's actually not that many birds out. Maybe we'll have a good chance of watching some birds splish and splash around in the water, but not now, as everything is hiding away from us at the moment, which seems to be about normal. <laughs> So we're looking. I'm looking for anything that's moving in these bushes. Ooh, and maybe should keep my eyes on the road at some point too. And all that rain that we had, even though it was nice soaking rain, um, we've had a couple of roads that don't like the rain very much caused erosions. So some of the roads need to be regraded again. And I'm pretty sure when Rexon is back, Rexon's coming back, when is he coming back? Wednesday, I think. I'm pretty sure in between drives he'll be back at it again in his big tractor, perhaps dragging tires or first scraping the roads. Hmm. Checking the trees, anybody sitting in the branches? No. Right, well, we'll try our luck 
Maybe we'll have to go into the Mulwati, perhaps catch some elephants that side. Off you go to Tristan, who's got something that flaps its wings pretty quickly. I do indeed. Now it's bouncing around all over this plant and making it a little difficult to see, but it is a butterfly. I was saying that there is noticeably more butterflies flying around today, and I'm just trying to ID exactly which one. It looks like maybe a dusky copper. That's what it looks like. I'm just waiting for it to open its wings, or oh, now it's flying again. I was hoping it would just do a little open for me that we'd see it. So it keeps going away and then landing back on this plant, so we're just going to wait for it. There we go. It's now landed once again in the same spot, and it's opening every now and then and giving a little bit of orange tinge so it does look like a little dusky copper it's over here Greg Greg you can see it over there so I know there's lots of grass in your way I'll try and get that rid of that have you got it there Greg yeah, lots of wind as well which is not ideal so a lot of butterflies already flying around like I said I've seen this guy I've seen some of the little spotted blues, I saw a citrus swallowtail, monarch, even some of the acreas are around as well. So it should be a good afternoon for butterflies. Hopefully what's going to happen is we're going to get a bit of a wind and the wind will then settle down and it will cool off a bit and then these butterflies should stop from flying around and will make it a lot easier. There we go, Craig, it's now actually even closer to you. So, But it is bouncing around all over the place, which is not making life ideal at all for poor Craig. Craig's having to bounce around on different plants all over the place. But isn't it beautiful? with those little spots and stripes and markings and then when it opens its wings it's more brown on top with a little orange section so i'll just double check exactly which one it is but i'm pretty sure it's one of the coppers i'll just have to double check exactly which copper oh, sorry craig that's my fault i've dropped a piece of grass and <laughs> fly past craig's face but just, they will be out because there will be a number of plants that are flowering and with the bit of rain that we had and now a little sunshine you're going to have perfect conditions for butterflies to go and get all the nectar out of and pollen out of these plants and be able to actually feed on that. Now apparently you can see it's a proboscis going into the plants and actually f feeding off that nectar which is very very cool. It's not every day that you can see that. Now in terms of the difference between moths and butterflies you can see how this insect keeps its wings closed for the most part and it's very very active now during the day. A moth is far more active during the night and when it lands it will land with its wings down and flattened against its body. Also, if you look at these guys, they have club-like antenna, so very thin antenna with a little sort of swollen end to it, whereas moths tend to have a feather-like antenna that gives them a little bit of a difference between the butterflies. So if you're wondering how they kind of work and what the difference is between the two, then that is it. <coughs> But very, very cool. Excuse me. Sorry, I was just coughing there a little bit. It seems as though there's a lot of insects out here. I'm actually just looking around. A lot of buzzing about and lots of flies and all kinds of other things. So hopefully we'll see lots of different types of things. Now, sorry, Nick, if you can just repeat the first part of that question. I heard it turns into butterflies, but I didn't get the first part. Ooh, so David, what percentage of cocoons turns into butterflies? That's a difficult thing to say. I think it depends on different areas. I would imagine that some areas there's a lot more predation than there is in others. I mean, if you look at out here, there's going to be huge amounts of animals that will predate on poor little caterpillars that are going into a chrysalis to start kind of hatching. So I actually wouldn't be sure as to what to say to that. I, I know last year, though, we had a fallen over tree with the creas that went up and at one point I think there was about 12 chrysalis on there and after about a week there was only one still dangling so if you go on that you'll have you know a very 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 small percentage but it, it depends I think it depends on the area that you're in the amount of predators that are around how well they've concealed themselves when they go into that state and they then start to kind of go through a metamorphosis it's going to be interesting I, I honestly have no idea what the percentage would be in a system like this. I think we would have a, you know, it would be something that we'd have to kind of monitor and you'd have to get a sample size and then try and work it out amongst them. Right, let's carry on, Craig. Let's see what else we can find. Ah, Patrick, you're asking if I have a favorite butterfly. I don't know if I have a favorite individual butterfly, but I do have a favorite in terms of 
a family of butterflies. So my favorite butterflies that we see, well, there's actually two. One is the Shiraxes family. So the Shiraxes family for me are absolutely beautiful. Um, there's one called the Fox Raxes, which is a very, very cool name. And then also the Swallowtails. So things like the Citrus Swallowtail are absolutely beautiful. They're vivid colors, quite large butterflies, and they've got these little tail streamers that come down. So those two families are really my favorites um, and the ones that I like to see the most. I, there are others that are quite difficult to find around here that in certain other parts of South Africa you can see that maybe are, would be on that list, but those are the two kind of families, and, and particularly here in, in this part of the world, I would say probably the Foxy Shiraxes and the Citrus Swallowtail are my two favorites that we see. Hopefully we'll be able to find either one of those this afternoon. It'll be quite nice. Like I said, I did see a Swallowtail fly past us just now, and so while I go looking for them and seeing if we can find them, let's hand you over back to Brent, who I think has left that poor elephant and is carrying on on his way, and let's see what he's going to be up to. So welcome back guys, I know a lot of you would prefer to stay there and stuff like that but at the moment I don't want to add any pressure on that animal. The Sabi sands are en route, um, I will go back and take them there a little bit later in the drive. So for the moment let's see if we can find our little prince. This is where we left him this morning and I said with Hasana it's unlikely that he's lying in the same spot during the day. He likes to cruise around and he is not there. So he was lying at the base of that little bush there this morning, so he's not there. There's no tracks of him heading down towards that elephant, which is probably more, most sensible for him because I think that Ellie would take most unkindly to the presence of any predators at this very moment. But I'm gonna just check some of the other bits of shade around here. You might have moved a little bit uh, during the day. I'm just seeing if the other game drive vehicles tracks head off a little bit. So what we're doing is, is that him there? Oh, are my eyes playing tricks on me? Let's have a quick look. Whoopsie. I swear I saw spots in this thicket, but I think I've got spots on the brain. Uh, okay, well, I try to figure out where her son has gone. Oh no, you're staying with me. It seems like the gremlins are out in force today. Birmingham boys are back on the property and child of the universe is asking what how far away from this injured elephant they're actually quite far uh, we're down towards the southeast of uh, Juma and the Birmingham's are up in the north uh, the northwest sort of afternoon Henry um, no updates just yet uh, Batalier Road is zoned um, due to an uh, injured elephant bull, so please steer clear of that area. Uh, no sign of a sign yet, we're trying to follow up, but uh, till the Sabi signs has come to have a look at the Eddy, uh, Batalier is zoned. Okay. We're just checking all the little spots of shade. Where is Hassan at? Uh, I might do a little loop onto the road, see if his tracks come out. But in the meantime, let's go see where Madam McCurdy is heading to next. Well, Brain, you won't believe who we just spotted very briefly. It was that big tusker that was uh, chasing you around this morning. He's basically between Mumba Road and Drakensberg. And he's, I think, I'm hoping he's following a breeding herd because that's a breeding herd I'd like to try and find. So we can't get to the elephant, of course, because he is in the middle of the thicket, and you all know I don't off-road for elephants, especially not a must bull. <laughs> Never. So we're going to just drive around here, but I'm just checking carefully in the thickets. It's so easy with this long grass and big trees to miss a fully grown elephant, even to miss 30 elephants. And I would think that he's trying to find breeding herds, especially if he is in must, like we were talking about earlier. He's basically just going to be driven by his testosterone at the minute. They will be munching along the way, but he'll be marching, marching constantly, trying to pick up a scent on a group of females. Oh, there's Brent. 
actually. <laughs> Let's go say hello to Brenty. I'll tell him that his friend is coming to find him. Perhaps that's what, maybe that's what that elephant is doing. Hi, Brent. Hi. Your friend, the elephant must bull, is on his way to you. On his way to you. Do you think he's given him a hiding? Mm, there's Brent. Brent's on the radio. Let's watch how Brent operates the radio from... <laughs> So he's trying to follow tracks. I'm actually going to turn around because I don't want to squash any of Hosanna's tracks. Maybe we'll go down towards Chitwa. So this is the area Brent is working. So Brent might even find that herd of elephants. But like Brent said, perhaps that big fella has already given another young bull a hiding. And we were talking about this the other day, in fact, where um, we had that very, well, rowdy young elephant bull um, playing with another elephant bull. And if a big tusker like that came across that young fella being cheeky, he may meet the same, well, might go down the same road and tusk him. That happens quite often, in fact. Very sad for that elephant, though. Very, very sad. But I don't think there's much you can do if its intestines are hanging out. Whew. Not great at all. <laughs> now, for those of you who haven't met Daryl the elephant, who's my favorite elephant, he roams around on the Sabi sand. He spends most of his time down at Earth Lodge at Sabi Sabi. Um, he's that elephant with a bell shape in his ear. All well, the Snapchat symbol, some of you have said. Looks like the little ghost. And Senek, you've asked if this testosterone makes elephants a little bit cheekier. Most certainly it does. And Daryl's a prime example of it. Whenever he comes up and causes havoc, he's normally in mast. But um, he, it's like he enjoys the vehicles and causing trouble with them. And it's quite funny because that was like one of David's first elephant encounters. Interesting. And he hadn't been working in the bush at all, huh? Came straight from the city <laughs> and then met Daryl with Scott. <laughs> So yeah, and he's not a small elephant either. So, so yes, it does, Sinek, you're quite right. It, um, it indeed makes them cheekier. So you've just got to be wary of them and give them a bit of room and, uh, and just, well, watch them. Sometimes they're fine. Sometimes they just carry on with their day. I, I don't like, particularly like viewing elephant bulls and mass just because I've had some not-so-nice encounters with them, which I've told you all about. But yeah, anyways, it seems as though Tristan might be stomping around. Perhaps it's because he's got ants in his pants. I hopefully won't have this many ants in my pants because otherwise I'll be very uncomfortable. But we basically have been looking around and there's so much insect life after the rain that we decided we'll have a little look under a fallen over log just to see what's happening. And there's just a myriad of ants going absolutely crazy so they're all over this tree and they're moving around they're coming out and they're kind of streaming up and down there's a whole bunch on the ground as also well. i feel a little bad that we moved it so we'll put it back nicely just now but it's amazing to see how many are yeah, there must be hundreds of thousands of ants going up and down, utilizing this old dead tree as a way to be safely housed and to be able to hide away from various predators that might be out there. You'll find that's why things like even aardvark sometimes will try and break towards these kind of dead trees and dig underneath and try and then get to all of this that is moved on. You can actually see that some of them are busy carrying eggs um, out of the actual area and moving them around. In fact, I'm not even sure these are ants, some of them. Some of them might even be termites. There's an interesting one that's kind of going along, which is this individual over here, and it's moving very fast. Oh, no, it's gone and hidden. But there was a really large one that was in amongst them that was moving quite quickly, and it almost looked a little termite-like. And what could be happening is sometimes you'll have termites in these kind of trees like this, and the ants actually raid them, and they try and kind of take the eggs and actually even carry off some of the termites as well. Ants are ferocious predators. They're amazing things to watch. But it also looks like some of them, I'm just trying to have a little look because it's difficult to see, but there's little eggs that are actually being carried as well by these ants. So there's some of them are picking up little egg larvae, and they're now moving them along deeper into the actual um, 
depths of this tree to try and just hide them out away a little bit better. So I'm not going to actually spend too long here because obviously we've disturbed their nest a little bit. So I want to put it back nicely. But before we do that, what you will find is also over here is that we've got a very interesting situation there. You've got a carapace for a dung beetle by the looks of things. Now what that could indicate is two things. Either the dung beetle when it was very, very soft decided to kind of lay its last egg in this area and bury its little ball if it was one of those that does bury balls. Or there's a situation where there might have been a scorpion living in this particular tree. And so as we have these kind of dead trees, you'll find lots of scorpions live inside here, particularly a scorpion called Pistacanthus asper. And they spend a lot of time kind of moving around in dead trees, and they'll hunt various insects from there. And so what it might have done is actually caught it, fed off it, and then this is just the exoskeleton that is now left after the scorpion has fed, which is pretty crazy. So no, it's very difficult to say how many ants are in each colony. As you can see here, counting this many ants is nearly impossible. One, because they are moving so fast. Two, because there's just literally so many that you'll be here probably for the next 10 weeks trying to count all of these ants. So difficult to say. I would say that there must be easily thousands within this particular colony because it's not only here that there's a lot of movement. There's a whole bunch of movement on the ground as well. So there's literally ants all over the place here. You can see where Craig is sitting. Uh, the ground is literally crawling with ant species that are moving around. So there's far too many for, for us to count and to know exact numbers. Also the way that they go back and forth to individually know know which ant you've counted and which one you haven't would make it very difficult. You'd probably have a situation where you'd have far too many ants to that you'd recount. Now, Nicole, don't... ...is incapacitated. Oh my goodness, sorry about that, everybody. Tristan? Did the ants get him? Perhaps they, because he said he hopes he doesn't get ants in his pants. Maybe they crawled on in there and he had to stomp around. I don't know what just happened there. Um, so we're driving down Cheetah Cut Line now, looking. Still looking for a herd of elephants. I wonder how long it's going to take me now. Shall we play a game on how long will it take Taylor to find a herd of elephants? I think it's going to be another three game drives. So this afternoon, I think by tomorrow afternoon or the following morning, I might put a herd of elephants on screen, we'll see. We have to start the counter again. <laughs> and, oh, I see some impala up ahead. We can go and have a look at them. Maybe they'll want to stay around. We'll quickly check here for Tingana. I should probably ask the guides if anybody's relocated on Tingana, seeing as I'm approaching the area. Let me do that. Sheldon, Sheldon, can you copy me? And just chat to Sheldon quickly. Huh? Dylan, Dylan for Taylor. Maybe they're not even in the east anymore. Oh, I just can't hear them. Also a possibility. Who's shouting in here? Oh, there's ho those horns there. The fighting hornbills. There you go. So cool. Listen to them. Very chatty. <laughs> Look at the way they run. Why are you wearing long pants? It's a hot day. They are quite warm too. They're very chatty, these two. Flying around looking for beetles and all sorts of other things that may be crossing the road. What is it doing? The other one's coming in to join it. Now they're done. Did you catch something? No? No caterpillars? Always enjoy watching hornbills feast, but now you can see. Sadly, not successful, but we'll just give the beak a good clean anyways. Very cool. Now I can hear the babblers. Very nice. Well, let's go down to the little pan, because I think that's where all the impala are gathering. Perhaps we're going to see Wilbur the warthog. That would be a nice surprise. Wilbur the Warthog's pan is filled up so much you won't even recognize it. He might have to be careful. He might have to wear a life jacket if he wants to go in there. Now, speaking of animals popping into the road, Avon wishes you've just asked about 
whether a leopard has ever popped onto the road uh, while I've been driving. Yeah, well, it actually happens often. A gajima does that to you, and then you normally just see his tail disappearing. Um, who else has done that? Oh, Karula's done that so many times. Oh, there's so many elephant tracks here. But they're all going this way. I think this is the breeding herd that was here. Oh, my goodness. All the impala and the sabi sand will stop here, and then they might get a, be a bit nervous for now, but I reckon they'll settle. Hello. How's it going, Impala? Where's Wilbur? Oh, this is really nice, actually. Listen to the sounds. That's all this great audio of these Impala. All very nervous, all very chatty at the edge of this pan. Now, if you have no idea who I'm talking about when I say Wilbur, Wilbur is a warthog. He's my favorite warthog. He's got no hair on the end of his tail and he's an old boy. He um, chased Gwen out of her warthog burrow, or out of the burrow in a termite mound, and then took it for his own. It was probably his first, which was quite funny. But he's a very relaxed warthog and he normally lays in the corners of the pans and he's stuck as you can drive right up to him and he doesn't run away which is quite nice because the typical sighting we get of a warthog is well their bottoms with their tails in the air impala why are you all talking so much it's like it's all the lambs are separated from their mothers and they're sort of all doing their own thing just chatting with one another supposed to keep in contact to say everything's okay all a bit nervous down at the water's edge though they don't drink for long I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I mean, an animal just doesn't keep its head down and down and down. They'll drink for a couple of seconds and then put their heads up and look around. And that's important because Tingana was not far from here. Could be a crocodile in the water. Could be a number of different things. But very nice to see so many impala. We've been having some great impala sightings. In fact, we're very lucky. We better make the most of them, of course. Off you go across to Tristan, who is having a look at some of the flora. I am indeed. I haven't seen one of these in ages, and well, I'm so excited that we found one. It's a small little bush that we've got right in the middle of, well, just close to the dam cam, and I didn't actually know it was even here, which is very, very exciting. Now, I've got to apologize first before we carry on about our little gremlin attack we had earlier. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened there, but back to our plant. We have the most delicious smelling tree we have out here. When you pick this and you squash it and you smell it, Mm, it smells like a lemony mint kind of smell. So it's known as Lipia javanica or fever tea. And this plant is really, really cool. It's used for a number of different things. It's a really good plant for things like asthma, if you've got coughs, if you've got any sort of blockage in your sinuses, you kind of will use this. And if, unfortunately, that elephant did die, it would have a situation where you could put this in your nose if you were going to that carcass. And all you'll smell is this lemony mint smell rather than this horrible kind of rotting meat smell. So I often used to do this with guests. Whenever we used to go to a carcass, you'd pick this and then you'd just shove it up your nose. Now, of course, you look absolutely weird when you do it. And I'll do it for you guys so that you can see. It looks really odd, but I promise you, if you've ever smelled a dead elephant, then you would know that you would do this. It would be much, much better for you. So basically, you just do something like that. Now, there we go. Do I look good? No, I'm just joking. So basically like that, and then all you smell is this really fresh kind of minty lemon smell as opposed to rotting meat. It really makes things much, much better. And I'm probably sure that most of you can't take me seriously. Craig is definitely laughing behind. Now, the other things that they use this plant for, quite interestingly enough, is it's used as a plant that they will rub on people. And they say that it keeps crocodiles away from you. So if you're ever going into an area where there's crocodile infested water, they reckon if you rub this on yourself, the oils from this will repel crocodiles. I'm not sure that that's very, very true. It's an interesting kind of thing. The other thing is also is if you have meat that has been infected with anthrax, they reckon that this plant rubbed on that meat will actually get rid of that anthrax. I'm 
a bit debatable about that one as well. I don't think I'd want to try and eat anything that's infected by anthrax after it's been rubbed with a plant. But, yeah, you know, these are the things that sometimes people believe. And so it's a quite an interesting plant. The, for me, it's just the most amazing smell. And you can make a tea from, a substitute from it. You kind of boil the water and you put it in and then you add milk into it. And it's actually not too bad. So it does actually taste all right. I have made tea from it before. It's not the best tea you'll ever have. It's like a green tea, but it is pretty good nonetheless. And I didn't actually know that there was one right here so if anybody in camp has got sinus issues this is where we need to come to be able to get it it's a really cool smell now all i can smell is mint and sort of lemony and so and it's a situation where it kind of feels funny now and it's a bit of the leaf is a bit scratchy so it makes your nose itch a little bit so i'm going to have probably going to be have like this wiggly nose as we do the rest of the segment now i was busy talking about just now when we got so rudely interrupted by the gremlins i was talking about ants swarming so the only time we would see ants swarming is if there's a food item so if let's say if you're at home you see ants and you drop maybe a sugar solution so a sugar and water you'll see the ants will then swarm around that in order to feed off it. But other than that, not really. They're also, I suppose, if they're in defense of their, their nest, then you'll find ants will kind of come in and try and defend in you know, a big grouping. But other than that, no, not really. They just kind of go in lines and they'll go and, f and find food and they distribute out, but they don't actually swarm anything unless it's either food related or in defense of their nest that they're close to. So it's a pretty interesting thing to see. And ants are phenomenal creatures. I absolutely love them. There's actually a, a thought that if they were the size of a medium sized dog, that none of us would even be surviving because of the sort of prowess as predators they would have a situation where they would probably just take over completely good we're going to carry on we're going to try and see what other little weird and wonderful things we can find in the open areas and see what there is and while we do that let's send you back across to brent and find out whether he's had any more luck with hosanna or if he's still with the big gray pachyderms Well, we're back with the injured Ellie. Um, the Sabi Sands are about to arrive, so I'm just here to see what's happening next. Now, we're going to do a quick update here. Now, a herd of elephants have moved into the area as well, so he's actually surrounded by other elephants. Now, the problem is apparently that big must bull that we saw this morning. Taylor's bumped into him already this evening, and he was heading in this direction. So, it could be a mute object if that that must bull decides to sort of finish the job i think he's the culprit um who, who who perpetrated that injury i can't see him at the moment we've got a few down towards the area there now the big problem is this is the last direction um that hasana went so with injured elephants and must bulls around we don't really want to get out and track hasana on foot um, so we're just just checking quickly here and sorry I'm just looking at that in I'm just making sure I can't see the big must ball just yet you can see he's still constantly throwing dirt, dirt on the wound Okay, well I can see, oh he's starting to move now, shame boy, yeah, there you, go, you can see there, it's the same Eddie, okay, I don't want to be stuck here with the other elephants, so next I gotta get out of here, so we're gonna send you across, um, we don't want to be caught out in a bad position with these eddies. So I say you've got to be very careful um, when there's injuries around. Just moving out of the way. Giving them lots of space. Okay, so while we see what's happening here next, uh, let's go across to Tristan uh, to see how his bushwalk's going. 
Well, Brent, I think it's a good idea probably to get yourself out of the way of the Ellies and make sure that you do not get yourself squashed on Rusty. I rather like Rusty, and so I don't want to see something happen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Also, you as well. We don't want to see you getting yourself into danger. And so hopefully that will all play out. Now, we're still just ambling about, kind of having a look, and I'm trying to look closely at all the plants because I'm sure we're going to get some cool insects after the rain that we had over the last few days with the sun, brilliant sunshine we've had since yesterday. We should have had quite a few insects starting to at least lay eggs, hatch, or be in the area. And so we're just kind of walking and trying to check and to see what we've got in this section. And it's been lots of movement, but nothing really sitting still, which is what makes it difficult in the afternoons when you're doing insect looking. And so Dale, yes, the scorpions in this area, all of them will glow under UV light, so they have a chemical within their um, within their exoskeleton called hyaline, and that hyaline reacts under UV light and you get this glowing scorpion. So what we'll try and do, I don't have a UV light with me and we're not going to be out late enough for it to be really dark to find a scorpion and actually do it, but I'll try and find one somewhere along the line on one of the drives when we're out and we'll try to get a UV light and show you. But yes, the answer to that is all of our scorpions here do. Now I thought I saw some colour I did. There we go. So there's probably one of the more colourful feathers that you get out here. It's a bit bedraggled and probably came out during the course of the rain but it's from what looks like a lilac breasted roller feather and um, you've got these beautiful beautiful um, blues purples that come across this way and it fades into a more sort of light coloration so I would imagine this is from a lilac breasted roller if it was a purple roller we wouldn't get this brilliant electric blue here and the European rollers don't get this kind of color almost purpley blue towards the edge of the wing so from a lilac breasted roller and like I say it probably came out during the wet you can actually see the tips of the feathers are kind of bonded together and because this is not on a bird this is what would have happened if the bird was still wet and then if it grooms it with its beak and kind of goes with the beak a little bit and just sort of runs their beak through you can see the feather starts to actually gain its shape again and starts to look a lot more healthy and more feather like so that's why they preen a lot after rain is why you see them fluffed out and why they try and then run their beaks through their feathers in order just to soften everything up again and get them looking into good condition so that they can fly effectively but this would have been like I say during the rain unfortunately and that poor bird would have had to just grow another one and it does happen quite regularly that they lose feathers from now and well every now and then good let's carry on Lots of interesting kind of things happening. I feel like there's a lot of growth of grass that's gotten very tall, but interestingly enough, as I'm walking around here, it's really actually not very thick. So the grass is quite sort of patchy in places. You can see lots of big gaps between the grass. So while we've been driving around at the moment and we've been moving around we've got a situation where there's kind of you think that there's a really thick carpet of grass over the last few weeks but it's actually a little bit less than you think and then once we get some really dry weather this should die down quite quickly and we'll actually see that it's quite barren still there's a lot of big gaps between the grass sort of clumps and that's going to mean a tough winter still for a lot of our animals even though the grass looks healthier and, and longer than what we've seen there still isn't that thick cover that we used to have back in the day Right, and I just heard some of the, just heard some grey go away birds alarm calling a little bit. I wonder if maybe the Wahlberg's eagles are not around. Gnome, so you're talking about a leopard that killed a cheetah today and in the Kruger Park, I gather, is where you saw that because I did see a post about it. Why would that have happened? So basically well, how that happens, and it's something that is quite common, particularly in certain parts of the Kruger, down towards actually where Hukumuri comes uh, from, Crocodile Bridge. It happens there every now and then. Then and basically what the situation is is that generally cheetah are going to be catching and hunting and killing something like an impala and they're hunting in areas on the fringes of quite dense area or quite with big thickets and they kind of catch things in the open and then what happens is these leopards find them there and they rush in and they grab these cheetah and get them while they are still feeding and they're so preoccupied with the feeding process that they don't see the leopard coming and the leopard being a much more physical stronger animal grabs them and then kills them and they have a situation where they unfortunately then get you know are, are dead and then they dragged up into the tree and eaten so a leopard is a very opportunistic animal 
is something that it will try its very best to try and find food all the time and, and whether that be an impala or a cheetah is irrelevant to them. Nutrients is nutrients and they will go after it and they will actually feed on them. It's not like they're going to just put it up in the tree and leave it. They will actually eat cheetah. So it's a not a common, common thing, but it does happen quite a bit in the Kruger. I think in the last few years I've seen maybe seven or eight at incidents at least of leopard killing cheetah and hoisting it up into the tree and eating it. So not a very nice thing to witness and certainly not what we want to see, but that's nature. It's how things go and it's the way it's gone for many, many years in the past. So we'll just have to, you know, hope that the cheetah population, wherever it may be, continues to grow. It's been a good couple of years for cheetah in the Kruger, so it should be all right. Now, we'll carry on. We're going to see what else we can find. I think Brent's got himself out of that sticky situation. And so while we carry on, let's go back to him and find out what happened. So, sorry about that, guys. We're still busy trying to sort out the issue of this elephant. Um, the Sabi Sands I just had a chat with. Um, they have, uh, so, in theory, if, you, if anything has to be done with an elephant, it has to come with, uh, well, in Pumalanga, which is the province we're in. Uh, it has to be notified to the, uh, the parks board. Sorry, guys. Standing by. So it's fine. They they are now between Batalia and Yala Road South in that Shkova. Uh, so Spaghetti Junction that side is fine. The station also updates uh, Kudu alarm call. It sort of sounds like Nyala Road North Junction with um, Central Road. I'm following up. Okay, so we've zoned that area and. We're not letting any other vehicles into that area. Uh, that must bull arrived while we were there looking at the injured animal. Uh, the injured animal immediately started walking towards us. That's what you saw there. We couldn't see the big must bull coming. So we've just left that area completely alone and uh, we're gonna go follow up. So while we were chatting, there were kudu alarm calling uh, directly north of where we were. So around Central Road, and I'm pretty sure that's Hasana. So we're gonna go have a look in that area now. So what we'll do is we're gonna head down there, we're gonna switch off, we're gonna listen, um, and see if we get any luck with uh, the little prince. So we were sitting down there, due north will be anywhere from here. So let's just turn the engine off and drift down the road. Hope to hear some of those alarm calls. So it's quite late in the afternoon, so probably nothing will be done um, about that elephant at the moment. As you can see, that the wound doesn't seem to be hampering his movement and whatnot too long or too much but the problem is it's not now while the wound's fresh it's once the stiffness sets in and uh, especially because it's a gut wound in a in five days or four days time when it's incredibly infected and that animal's in a huge amount of pain it will become incredibly aggressive and that's where that elephant might be a possible problem so we'll wait to hear back from uh, MTPA which is the, the government body and I'm pretty sure they'll be sending someone out here tomorrow morning to try to follow up. I don't think that elephant is going to move too far from that area and but unfortunately we will not be doing any elephant tracking on foot while we're uh, I mean but leopard tracking on foot while we've got all of that over there so let's hope Hasana is deciding to be kind to us this afternoon and stays close to the road so I don't have to go walking. In the meantime let's go see where Madame McCurdy is. Heading back to camp. <laughs> this seems to be like a common trend these days. I promise though, I'm not trying to sneak off after of safari. Wendy's been fine mechanically, and then all of a sudden, after Zimpala, once we started the car, we carried on driving. She's making a shuddering noise, and I've opened up the hood of the car, and it's very, very, very hot inside there. Well, I don't, I don't know what it is because the fan belt's still going around and round. 
Um, oh, I'm pilot running across the road. I'm not really sure. So I've got Opar's number. I, I, Opar's our mechanic, by the way. I hope he, or maybe he's not here. It's a, no, there's no such thing as a Sunday when you work in the bush. So, woo! <coughs> First, we're going to get rid of that sneeze. Woo, that gave me goosebumps. Thank you. Um, and we're just slowly making our way back to camp. I seem to be losing power. So like my foot's quite far down on the accelerator, not really going anywhere anymore. So we're just going to hope that we make it home. We're not too far away. Um, so I'll have a little look. Woo. Now, as we drive along, hopefully we'll be able to hear what Daniel has uh, just been talking about. And that is, can another line as well... Identify, uh, identify, identify another line from its raw. The answer to that is yep, yes, yes, yes. They can indeed. Um, I suppose we might not be able to hear the difference all the time, but sometimes with lines you can hear. Um, well, they've got different pitches at which they they roar. So just like I don't sound the same as David, David doesn't sound the same as me. Each lion roar will be unique, and of course, lions can understand one another. We can't understand them. So they will indeed be able to tell the difference. Um, remember, that's how lions try and find one another. Uh, if a coalition, say the Birmingham boys have all split up and one is looking for the other, he might do a big roar to try and locate his, uh, his fellow coalition members. Or the same thing with the Nguhuma pride, for example. If any of the lionesses, they get separated. They often start with contact calls if they think they're close by. But if they are a little bit further away, they might end up doing a roar. And then, obviously, the rest will reply. And then that's how they'll find one another, which is quite cool, I think. And like I said, sometimes you can hear it, especially with the male lions. And if you get to hear them roar often enough, you'll be able to know, be able to notice the different types of roars. Like one of the four ways males, which is uh, two boys that lived at Sabi Sabi for a little bit. They then moved on, though. They went into Kruger. And then when the Charleston males arrived and uh, the one male with very orange eyes had the deepest roar I've ever heard in my entire life. It was so cool. It was the gruffest roar of any lion. It was amazing. And he wasn't a particularly big boy either, but he, listen, what he lacked in size, he made up in, uh, in his roar. It was really quite cool, in fact. So, so yeah, that's quite nice. Yeah, I haven't heard a lion roar. We hear them obviously for a distance, but I haven't had a lion roar right next to my car since I've been back in SA. That would be a lovely treat. That really would. <coughs> and shoot, sure, must be, excuse me, must be all the grass. <laughs> now, I'll chat as long as I can. We're going to be pulling into the workshop shortly. So one last question from Katya. And that is, have I had any close calls with any of the animals? Yeah, oh, I have. I've had, my most recent one was with an elephant. In fact, an elephant cow on, on Chitwa Chitwa. Looking at this breeding herd and then this cow sort of came out and she didn't look very happy. We were so far away. And the next minute she just ran and she pushed a whole tree down to try and get to us. I reversed so quickly. David, were you with me again for the Again, 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 again. David was on the car with me. So yeah, that wasn't fun. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't a close, close call. I moved away, but if I think if I stayed put and I didn't start the car and drive away, I would have been in a lot of trouble. She would have moved me. Um, hippos I've had close calls with on foot. I have also had a close call with buffalo on foot before, a buffalo. That was a lot of fun outside the tent. And then also, with elephant bulls in must that I didn't necessarily know were in must or I was trapped. I got trapped by a breeding herd on a forested road once when I first started guiding. That was terrifying. Right, I'm going to send you to Tristan who's probably walking around here somewhere. If I look carefully enough, I could see him. I'm going to very quickly open the hood of my car and see what's going on with it. But off you go to Tristan.
Welcome back. Sorry about that, folks. I was um, on the phone again just um, with the guys making sure that everyone stays away from that area um, with the general manager of Juma. Uh, he just wanted an update, so I was just giving him a quick update. So I'm back, and uh, hopefully Taylor gets her tech fixed quickly, and so does Tristan. Now, I'm hoping that Hosanna is somewhere in this area. I nearly said quarantine, you know that. You know, that's a blast from the past, have you? Because uh, how many times have we had quarantine here? Sure. At least 25, 30 with VM alone. So I, I just sort of, and I haven't been on Juma for, for quite a while, so I almost said, quarantine. It'd be nice. No, it wouldn't actually be very bad for how the leopard dynamics of quarantine arrived. But uh, this is the area where we heard those kudo alarm calling. So we've just been sitting quietly and listening. And unfortunately, we haven't heard any more alarm calls. So I'm gonna check down a little bit further towards Inyala Road South, north. And um, the Ellies are down in there and we're gonna keep clear of that area for now. It is absolutely sweltering today. It's a good thing. One of the most important things when you're out in the bush and it's very hot, uh, to make sure you drink enough water. It's not uncommon that we'll drink two to three liters of, a water, of water in one drive, especially at this, when it's this, this temperature. I mean, it's 36 degrees Celsius. I must say, I'm quite impressed with myself. I was on the phone to Jamie after drive this morning, and I said, today's gonna be a stinker. I think it's gonna get to 35 degrees. And it was 36, so not too far off. Now what I'm also trying to do is find the kudu. Oh, this is another good spot. Let's actually just get down into the shade. Let's have a look around here. Now of course it's beautiful and green at the moment, but in a few months it's going to be quite brown and, and grey. And uh, it's our fire season. CNAC is asking about wildfires and do we ever get them? We do occasionally. And uh, we also have controlled fires. We do controlled burns in this area. Uh, a lot of people think fire is bad. It's another one of those massive misconceptions because fire is good. Most of sub-Saharan Africa outside of the forest block um, which is obviously the Congo Basin rainforests and the rainforests in West Africa, is what you call a fire climax biome. And what that means is a lot of species, particularly the grass, needs the fire um, to climax. And that means it will destroy and bur burn all the moribund, dead grasses, dead seeds. Um, it helps enrich the soil. And so after fire, with a little bit of rain, you get incredible growth incredibly quickly. And most of our trees out here are fire resistant or fire retardant. So they don't actually get damaged that much. And even the small animals like tortoises, uh, mice and rats and, and uh, those type of things, the vast majority are able to get into the bottom of a thicket of something like a gwari, which is fire retardant, uh, and survive the, the the fire. So fire is actually a very good thing. Traditionally in Africa, um, in this type of area, those wildfires would have been started by lightning during the dry season or uh, right at the beginning of the wet season, and they could have burned many thousands upon hundreds of thousands of hectares. Uh, these days, because of people, we control them. So. Uh, most, depending on the type of soil, type of grass, most areas are most effective if burnt once every two to three years. So you'll have different areas that you cordon off and burn um, every two to three years. And what that does, oh, more elephants, Ellie's, Ellie's everywhere. Um, and what that does is create a very healthy ecosystem um, with the right balance between trees and bushes and grasses. Okay, now he seems to be heading up Nyala Road North. So I think let's do that. There might be some eddies heading towards Buffalo's Hook Dam. And we can sit there and listen. And we should still be close enough that if we do hear alarm calls again, we should be able to dash into this area. Well, 
while we're going through here, Paula is wondering about species of ever evergreen trees. This is one here. Um, the Tumbuti tree is an evergreen tree, and you see if I rip the leaf like that, it'll start bleeding a milky latex. Now that milky latex is highly poisonous and can burn one's skin. But Tumbuti's are evergreen. We've got lots of evergreen trees, actually. Well, not, the vast majority are not. The vast majority are deciduous. Uh, but ever, evergreen trees. Uh, we've got another one right here in the African ebony, or the jackalberry. There's another evergreen tree. Um, and uh, only one or two acacias are evergreen, and such as the brackthorn which is also here. Most of your evergreen trees will grow around these little riverbeds. Sorry, Vimpy, the brackthorn is all the way behind you. Um, Gwari bushes. So yes, we have a fair number of evergreen trees. Oh, I apologize, that is not a brackthorn. Is it? Just zoom in on the thorns again? I apologize, it's just a very green Dicrostachus, uh, or sickle bush. Um, so a lot of our trees and bushes are evergreen. One of the most important ones in terms of animals due to its palatability is the zizifus or buffalo thorn. This has got to be very careful. Oh, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. So this is a very important evergreen tree. Um, and during the winter months, it's not so important during the summer months, but during the winter months, you'll actually see a browse line where Impala, bushbuck, inyala, and kudu will feed on it extensively as well as elephants. So that is the buffalo thorn, and uh, it's got the most wonderful Afrikaans name. It is a blink blar vachebikibos, or vachebikiboem. Yeah? That's what I'm correct, yes? So it's called a wait a bit, which it translates to a wait a bit bush or tree. Now, the thing is, is because if you ever get stuck in it, you have to wait a bit to get out. So not only will it impale you, on a very sharp, straight thorn, it will hook you with a very nasty hooked thorn on the underneath. Now, of course, if you're very popular at being eaten, you need all the defenses you can get. Now, not only is it popular amongst animals, but it actually goes very well in salads. Especially when they're nice and fresh and green like that. Now, apologies at the moment that uh, I'm the only feed. There are tech issues with both Tristan and Taylor. Taylor is asking me if I'm live. Hey, firm Taylor. Um, so, T, I'm the only feed at the moment. So, uh, it could be a while. Um, okay, so we're going to try head towards Buffalo Waterhole. See if the Ellie's are going to go for a swim. Ah! Red back shrike sitting nice and high perched, eating as many insects as possible before the long flight home, well, back towards Europe. Uh, red back shrikes that have been ringed in South Africa have been re caught in bird nets in England, can you believe? So they'll be taking advantage, especially after that little bit of rain we had, uh, of eating as much, as many insects as possible before their long flight back towards Europe. They're very pretty birds. Now, certain birds will shed feathers from time to time, um, and that is called molting. And First Lady is asking, why on earth would they do that? Well, those feathers become damaged, um, will affect their flight patterns and whatnot. So they're constantly getting new feathers, and that's why they take a lot of effort in grooming and keeping those feathers in pristine condition. Now, it's very important if you are something like a redback shrike who has to fly that incredible distance all the way back to Europe for the summer. So they spend European summers in summer and African summers here. So they just live in summer permanently. Now we heard those kudu alarm calling quite a while ago, so it's not impossible that Hasana might have even got this far. 
So, always a good spot to check. This is still definitely one of my favorite roads on Juma. Inyala Road North as we meander up the little river system that comes out of Buffalo Hook Dam. Okay, I just want to check here on the soft sand. No, no sign of Hosanna coming this way. Now, of course, after the rain, there's been a bit of an explosion in insects, uh, but not so much in flowers. James was asking about baboon's tail. Uh, have they started flowering after the rain? No, James, and they're very unlikely to. They, are normally, they normally flower with the first rains, not the last rains. So their flowering season is well and truly over. It's very unusual to find any baboon's tails flowering this late in the in the, in the in the season. Okay, unfortunately, guys. So, although we are stable and here in present, uh, Conrad is running around like an absolute man mad trying to fix Bushwalk and Wendy. But to do that, he has to reboot our whole system, which means you're going to lose us as well. I will give you a little bit of a warning before that happens. Uh, but it, in the next little while, there's a possibility you're going to have to go into Tech Loop. We will be back. Hopefully, it won't be to me. Hopefully, we'll have Taylor and Tristan back as well. If it's just me, we will soldier on, don't you worry.
Kim back, unfortunately, so far. It's just me. Uh, Bushwalk's trying. I'm not sure. Oh, well, Taylor's is a mechanical problem, so Opa's on his way. But for now, you're stuck with the Wildebeest and me. Now, as I said, it feels like a bit like the old days again. And uh, for those of you who've been watching for a long time, Vildi will know. I remember, Vildi, when we only used to do one vehicle. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we'd only put two vehicles out Saturday, Sunday. Is that right, Vildi? Two vehicles in the afternoons uh, on the weekends. So, on the week. No, we also only used to do... Oh, there, were, there were only four of us. We didn't have enough staff, that was it. Uh, can you believe that three, just over three years ago, there were four of us, five of us. It was, it was Vildi, it was Brian, Andrew, you, Mark, me. That was it. Uh, and then Scott and Nikki, then James came, then Jimmy, Jandre, and oh, I can't even remember who else. Sure. So I, I'm not quite ready to give up on it yet. So I'm going to do one last big loop this area. We found where the kudu were, but they were looking very relaxed now. So maybe Hasana went off that way. So we're going to do another loop, Central Road, around towards Gwari Pan, and then maybe back down Gwari Pan Road. And then if we have no luck, maybe we'll go visit the Birmingham's. Now, I, I saw on Twitter, while Wildebeest and I were posting, posing, posting our fabulous selfie, uh, that about that cheetah that was killed by a leopard near Chokwan. And uh, it sounds like the cheetah killed an impala. The leopard obviously heard that commotion, rushed in, killed the cheetah, hoisted the cheetah, as well as eating and hoisting the impala, if I think I'm correct. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, next now I've completely gone off on a tangent and forgotten who was asking about that? Amy, sorry, Amy. Uh, and Amy is wondering, uh, do the cheetah ever come into Sabi Sands? Yes, they do, Amy. There's actually quite a, a reasonable cheetah population in the Sabi Sands. However, where we are is not the best cheetah country in the Sabi Sands. So there are some more open areas on the Gabbro soils where the cheetah spend more time. Uh, Tristan was the last person to see cheetah on Juba. And uh, he saw, a f I think it was a female and three sub-adults. Three sub-adults in the beginning of January. Somewhere around there. Uh, so the last person to see Shikhankanka on on Juma, I've seen them on Juma three or four times. I've seen the same two males, the ones we used to see on Cheetah Plains. Uh, I've seen them on Juma a couple of times. And then I've only ever seen one female on, on Juma, and that was actually on foot. So I, wasn't, I was tracking a leopard and I bumped into a cheetah and she got a fright and skedaddled off. But yes, they do come into the Sabi Sands. Uh, strangely enough, South Africa is, ha, is the only country in, the, in Africa where cheetah occur, um, where their population is actually increasing. So even Kenya, Tanzania, uh, the cheetah populations there are decreasing, and uh, the, cheetah, the cheetah in South Africa are increasing. The largest meta population of cheetah in, in Africa, now, when I say meta population, I mean the population with the greatest genetic, uh, genetic, I don't think there's such a word as genetic, genetic diversity, uh, and so therefore the most viable population of cheetah in Africa, we're actually sitting in it right now, we're driving through it right now. It is the greater Kruger. So that, uh, that, and the, there's incredible work being done by EWT, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, at spreading cheetah to as many reserves as possible. Now, 
I think I might have mentioned a while ago that uh, I was excited to come back to Juma, but uh, I was a little bit disappointed because the, there's lots of stuff going on in the reserve uh, where my parents live and my dad's in charge of all of that. And so the day I had to come back was the day we released the male cheetah from, from the boma and caught lions and uh, did all sorts of stuff and uh, I was at work. So I would have liked to have been part of that. I've been part of uh, Big Cat Game Capture quite a few times, but it's always an exciting thing to be part of. And um, we actually ended up moving them. So my dad's neighbor owns the Safari Wines shop. It supplies wine to a lot of the lodges here. And he donated his wine delivery vehicle. And uh, for that day, it wasn't delivering wine. It was delivering three lions um, from Kapama to Leadwood. So there's three lionesses in the Boma. But back to the Endangered Wildlife Trust and, 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 and Cheetah. So they've got a... A, a, a really incredible program with cheetah and wild dog that are reintroducing them to a lot of reserves where they haven't been for a long time and they will actually um, almost give you the cheetah with uh, and a lot of things as long as you adhere to their their sort of um, protocols and what happens is then uh, it they know the exact genetics of all the different cheetah that are outside of this meta population and then they're able to move and control moving males and females from different areas to make sure that the cheetah have the best chance at survival with the highest genetic diversity so they do an absolutely unbelievable job I must I mean I take my hat off to EWT um, and I'm very lucky enough that a good friend of mine is actually well uh, he's in charge of the wild dog project for this part of the world so when you see the collars on any wild dog here, my friend Grant is collecting that information. Now speaking of cheetah and a cheetah we came to know and love, who has unfortunately probably disappeared is Malaika. Laura was asking, has there been any word on Malaika? Not that I've heard, Laura, unfortunately. Not since her two boys were seen calling for her on the banks of the Olalorok River. Uh, there hasn't been any word on her just yet. So I'm hoping that she's still around, but I mean, she's such a recognizable cheetah and the fact that she hasn't uh, been seen now for probably over a month means that uh, she's either, I think she either drowned or got taken by crocodiles. So for those of you who don't know what happened, Malaika was a female cheetah uh, that Jamie followed the most, she spent the most time with, uh, but we all spent quite a lot of time with in the Mara. Uh, I saw oh, some incredible stuff with Malaika and uh, the Mara has had a huge amount of rain recently and uh, the cheetah was seen trying to cross a flooded river and the next day only two ma the two young boys were seen and there was no sign of Malaika. Now that was the last I heard. I haven't, I, ha I have kept a sort of, uh, not a, a close eye but a, a sort of a, a distant eye on what's been going on up there and uh, so far I haven't heard anything about Malaika yet. Uh, she was probably the most famous cheetah in the world uh, at, at, the, at the moment. So I think the, the five boys are are catching up there so very very sad but again like that elephant early on drive today these things happen out in the bush it's 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 I, probably, I don't I shouldn't say it again but I, I like the way it, it sounds it's not strawberries and cream really bad sad harsh things happen out here and that that's nature and it's in human nature to want to try interfere and try sort of change the outcome of, of what's going on but when human beings do that it actually makes things worse at the end of the day so uh, it's better to just let nature take its course so it is a it is a difficult one but that is the right decision Eloise is asking about the two boys. Are they okay? Uh, Eloise, I'm not sure. I'm not 100%. I, I will find out. How's that? I'll speak to Scott and Jamie, um, who are up there, and see if they've heard. Uh, no, let's go this side. What do you think, Vim? Quarry pan or hippopoles? Let's go quarry pan. I think that's the most likely spot for him to pop out. 
Okay. Well, I'm sure you are all sick and tired of hearing the sound of me, my voice and my continuous waffling. So let's go listen to some waffle from Tristan. Well, you're quite right. I think waffling is something that both of us can have a talent for and can do it uh, quite regularly. So anyway, we're back out again. We had to quickly race back to camp and try and sort out some stuff with the, the pack and with the camera, and we got it all right. And so hopefully that's the last of the gremlins, that they are gone and that they leave us alone for the rest. But it is a beautiful, beautiful evening. We've had a bit of cloud cover come in, and there's the most magnificent sky off to the south. We've got these blue 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 hues with this kind of wispy cloud that's there and then to our sort of western side we've got a I mean, eastern side we've got these massive storm build-ups that are happening so you can see these big clouds that have got beautiful color in them as the sun is starting to set so they're starting to get pinks and oranges and it is a wonderful time to be out walking at this time of the day it's one of my favorite times of the bu in the bush as everything's just kind of settling down the wind is settled completely but I will tell you one thing that it has gotten incredibly humid which might be an indication that we're going to see a little bit of rainfall at some point tonight I wouldn't be surprised at all it feels very close and muggy and sticky but still a beautiful day to be out and about so Bobby you are asking if there's a time or season when ticks hibernate so no there can be ticks throughout the year you can have a situation where you'll get um, ticks both now or well, in winter all the way through into the summer months but obviously there's a much higher percentage in the summer and you pick up a lot more in the summer and the reason for that is because that's when they start to breed and so they have a lot more little babies at that time the grass is also much longer and so there's a lot more space for ticks to inhabit areas and when you walk you then pick up a lot more so there's a higher percentage during the summer months when they're breeding but you can find them still in winter it's not as much but there definitely is still ticks in the winter months so it's something you've got to be aware of and you've always got to kind of pay attention but it's a drastically reduced number during the winter than there is during the summer as the grass dies down a little bit now sorry next you just i didn't hear you at all the car just came past us and it just threw the question part if you can just repeat uh, so plant fiend you're asking do i have a the vehicle most definitely I trust in the fact that I have walked around enough in the bush to know that I'll be okay and to trust that I've spent enough time with some very experienced people who have shown me a lot and taught me a lot and walking with guys like Herbie and Rex you learn and you kind of get to a situation where you become a lot more in tune with what's going on and so I find on walk that for the 99% of the time you feel fairly safe and particularly in areas like this is very open the chances of us coming across something that's going to be very very dangerous is very slim You'll see it long before you really get yourself into too much trouble, and so it's not so bad. I, I actually love walking, so I always feel fairly comfortable on foot. It's just that you've got to be a lot more aware of what's going on and take nothing for granted. So even though it is a comfortable feeling because you do it a lot, it's not to mean that it's complacent. So you can't have a situation where... You get complacent and you sit around and you, you don't pay attention to what's going on because then you're going to get yourself into a, to a bit of trouble. But definitely not an uncomfortable feeling walking. Good. Well, we're going to try and find some stuff. It's getting quite dingy now, so hopefully the insects are going to just start settling a little bit, find some of them, or maybe see if we can find some flowers after the rain. But while we do that, I believe Taylor McCurdy has also solved her gremlin issues and is also out and about and ready to entertain all of you. Woohoo! That's all I have to say. We're back up and running, and basically what had happened was Opa had actually serviced Wendy today, which is very cool, due for a, a service. He gave the engine a good clean and a good spray. So what it was was just a plug that had actually got wet. And because of that, it was causing the car to misfire, and we were losing power and all these things. But we, uh, well, we went back to Opa, he opened it all up, took basically a compressor, sprayed it down, dried it out, and now we're good. Now, something that I want to show you is the skyline. And all of a sudden, as soon as we pulled out of camp, the smell of petrichor was strong in the air. Those of you that are not sure what petrichor is, it's that very earthy smell, sort of like mold and fungus and wet soil that you get before you have rain. These clouds have come out of nowhere. This, uh, this morning, earlier today, I did mention, I was like, oh, there's wispy cirrus clouds, which typically mean that we're going to get rain in a couple of days' time, but perhaps... We've been having cirrus clouds in, in the last few days, maybe with all the rain that we have had, and I just didn't notice them. But it looks like 
I think we're going to have another storm on our hands. Maybe not now. I definitely think a little bit later, or perhaps tomorrow morning. Just interesting how that Petrus core smells around though. And then another good news is uh, Taxon has managed to uh, relocate on the Birminghams. So that's where we're going to be heading in a minute or so. We've just got to, of course, uh, get down there. So let's go. I'm so happy there was nothing really wrong with Wendy because she's been driving so beautifully lately. Um, so, well, let's, um, let's hope it stays away because I was confused. I thought to myself, my goodness, I'm wondering, like, why is this car doing this? It was so hot. All sorts of things. Can you see that smell is hectic, eh, Darby? It's a beautiful smell. Mmm, it's really, really nice. Okay, well, we haven't got far to go till we get to the Birminghams. I, yeah, hopefully, by the time we get there, if their heads are not laying on the long grass. But off we go to Tristan. He's found himself another flutterby. I have. So I was saying now that we it's starting to settle down a little bit. It's getting a little cooler. So things are starting to get to that point where it's going to get dark. And so a lot of the insects will start finding a place to sit, particularly the butterflies. And in particular, the acreas. They love sitting on a grass stalk like this. And this looks like a dusky acrea. It's just difficult because it's not opened its wings just yet. But I just want to double check. But it's got that white bar towards the end of the wingtips, which the dusky acreas do get. And so I think it's one of those. But isn't it amazing how we've had very few butterflies over the last little bit? And all of a sudden today, we've kind of had them coming out and a lot more around. It's been a kind of a little mini explosion of butterflies which is exciting because I know Brent loves butterflies and well I really enjoy watching them as well and I know a number of you do too so really pleasant just to kind of find them and, and, and spend some time with them. Now this one's being far more cooperative than our butterfly earlier and I must correct myself because earlier I said that it could have been a, one of the coppers but it was actually a hair tail butterfly so it was just when we kind of got back I got to see a picture of it from a screenshot and, and I know a number of you also commented on it so thank you for that and it's you know difficult with these guys when you're kind of standing and trying to look at a very small screen because generally we try to stand quite far from the butterflies because otherwise we spook them quite quickly so particularly this guy I'm standing relatively far away allowing it just to sit very nicely and so that Craig can get a nice shot of it which is working quite well it's perfect that it's sitting on top of the longest piece of grass that we've got in our immediate vicinity so that's making life a lot better which is very very cool so Paula butterflies in SA um, there will be one or two migratory species that we get um, so something like a brown veined white they will migrate uh, African vagrants do a little bit of a migration but there's nothing in the scale like we see the monarchs in, in North America that's a far bigger scale than any of ours but the brown veined whites do do a, do a migration I remember when I was a little kid I used to spend time in an area not too far from here on the Drakensberg mountains and that area we used to see a situation where you know we'd have these brown veined whites coming over this hill and down and we just get this cloud of white coming through it was really very very pretty and you just to stand there it was just this flurry of butterflies coming past it was almost like being in snow so really cool to see and uh, you know since when I was a kid was seeing those I haven't seen them and since then which is a bit strange and it's a bit worrying when you start to see insect migrations getting less and less and it's probably due to the increase of farming good well hopefully there'll be more little things lying in wait for us while we move around so while we do that let's send you back across to Brent who's still driving and I wonder if he's gonna get any luck with the little chief I'm trying desperately now what makes it quite difficult at the moment because of the injured alien that must fall in this area uh, and to walk and safe where he is he's far away so normally by now I would have skedaddled through being in the same area as Asana, uh, it's important for uh, my, my general well-being that I don't. Now, occasionally you come across those situations on foot while you're in the bush, uh, but uh, that, when you're not near, so you can deal with those situations and, and, and get out of there safely. So to put yourself in that situation when you know there's a potential for a uh, major risk, Chief. The little chief. Oh no, sorry about that everybody. 
My goodness, the gremlins have been terrible. Hopefully tomorrow morning will be a different story and we'll have all smiles. Right, I'm looking for Taxon. He should be here somewhere. He said that they hadn't moved too far and he's still on the eastern side of the road. <coughs> oh, there he is. Yeah, oh, there's another car there too. Fabulous. Now let's try and, is it Tax, is it Aubrey that's here? Let's try and figure out where those lines are. Well, everyone's looking at us now, which is normal. It's the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. I have to tell you this quickly before we get there. Driving into a sighting with leopards and lions and people stop looking at the animals to look at us. It's the most bizarre thing ever. So let's try and find a gap. I'd imagine though that these cats are probably tucked away. I was saying to David, they wouldn't have moved too far. I think it was just when the sun had sort of moved towards the west and then shining down on them because they were covered by trees during the morning. Oh my goodness, this is a tight squeeze. Let's just check. I see one. Let's quickly have a look and see where we can find the others. There's another one. Okay, we might have to just take this little gap here, hey David? Oh, it's not going to be great. <laughs> and you haven't got the best end of him either. <laughs> oh well. We'll search out for a little bit. I'm going to relax now. I'm going to get in here as you can see the horizontal position. <laughs> but there's the lion. There's one of them and the other two also scattered around the uh, sort of dwarfed silver cluster leaves and as well as some of the, um, the bush willow trees. So they haven't moved far. They've probably moved a whole of, I don't know, maybe 150 meters. That's it. So that's all. Hmm. Now, we were obviously talking this morning about the dynamics that are going on between the Avoca males and, or Avoca, sorry, and um, the Birminghams. And Peter Viper, you've just asked the question, why didn't the fourth Birmingham, I think it's in Fumor that's missing, why didn't he come up and help chase away the Avoca males? Well, we don't actually know if they had an altercation or not. I mean, I don't necessarily think that they knew that the the Avoca males were here, perhaps only once they arrived and they picked up on their scent. But we know what the Birminghams are like. Normally when they come back, they're very vocal lines. They start calling from far away. So perhaps they started their roars as they were passing through their old territory. Maybe those youngsters heard it and then, well, got on the move. And obviously as that sound was coming closer and closer and in their direction, I reckon they would have got out of there. And the reason why that other lion, I suppose, is not here is it seems as though he's quite comfortable with the Mungan breakaway pride, but Tristan knows quite about more about it, so maybe he can let you in on on that side of the story. And I think he said to me today it wasn't Fulmore that's down there. So if he's happy and he's found another pride, maybe he's just going to stay a bit further away. And three big male lines versus three uh, sort of youngsters, it's not. I don't think it's much of a challenge. Like I said, these boys are fit and healthy. They're in the prime of their life. They're not old, and they're much larger than those Avoca males and just their bellowing roars, all three of them at the same time, I think would be enough to chase them away. We we're talking about it today. We we're talking about how the Birminghams have definitely got an advantage because it's their turf, it's their land. They know this area exceptionally well. These other fellas are new. They don't really know what to expect, what's around the next corner. So you know what it's like whenever you have a sports game on home ground, you've got the advantage. And the match was here. The match was on the Birmingham's turf. So they've, they've gone. No one has seen them. Uh, I think that they've moved into Manuleti. I think they've gone back to a spot that they're probably more comfortable in. And maybe that's where they're just going to wait around and spend most of their time until they're up for the challenge, until they are big and strong enough to come on through and try and take on the Birmingham. Now, these lions have also traveled a fair distance in their day. Remember, the Birminghams arrived in, I think, winter of 2015. And <clears throat> I'm going to sit up quickly. And Avon wishes 
you just asked where did they or where did they get their name from so this kind of all ties in so these cats have come from very far away from the Timbavati and there is a property in Timbavati remember these are all old farms essentially and lots of the times people name their farms and that farm that the Birmingham pride is from was, was called Birmingham so that's where they got their name they left the pride they dispersed and then they came on down here and well they've well they kept their name so they've walked a huge distance to get here too i'm just seeing where everybody's moving to perhaps we okay maybe we'll do that hey what we'll do now is i'll try and get another gap here texan has moved on up and around so there must be another boy over there and i think we should be able to get a better view so while we reposition off we go back to tristan who's still looking at the ants well, good luck repositioning, Taylor. I hope that you find yourself a perfect place in order to get a good view of the Birmingham boys. And so what we're doing is we're sitting with a bunch of harvester ants, and I'm absolutely loving watching them because they found themselves a whole bunch of grass seeds that they are busily carrying back and forth into the nest, and then they're carrying some onto the edges, and it's just a complete kind of busy array of little grass seeds being carried all over the place it's quite funny to see because the, the ants are so small but <laughs> the grass seeds are kind of three times the size of them and they're kind of carrying them all over the place so absolutely fascinating to watch them going about their business and how much strength they have in order to be able to bring it to the actual entrance to the nest so lots and lots of things going on and amazing just watching the process as they go about it and the way that they kind of move things about and it's always easy to find these guys because because of the amount of debris that you find around the edges of the nest itself there's a, a massive amount of little grass bits that are all over the place and so they drag them in and then they feed off them and then they will basically take the husks out and so this is all the husk area over here you can see look how many little grass seeds they've brought out I mean that's all husks of grass seeds that they've already fed on and then dropped on the edges of their nest so this is a really nice large one and they've been taking advantage of the flurry of grass seeds that have come out over the course of this little bit of rain that we've had in the last month so really amazing to kind of see how they do it it's incredible watching them and it's tireless work ants never stop and so we saw the ants earlier moving about and thousands of them up and down the log and these guys are just as cool because they are just constantly working like this and to imagine how much effort it's taken to take this many seeds out of this area and to move them all over the place like this it's pretty incredible So, David, you'll find heavy rain can affect ants, in, in, particularly when we get times... Excuse me, I'm trying to talk here, go away, birds. They're being very loud about us. But you'll find in times of heavy rain, when we get flooding and stuff like that, ants will are very perceptive. So they often pick it up long before we even know about it and before the rain falls, and they'll then start to move. And you see them carrying their eggs, and they actually move into areas that are slightly higher. So maybe something like a termite mound, or even sometimes in towards trees, and they'll use trees as a nesting point while it floods and then once the the kind of flooding subsides then they back down into the ground itself so ants are a really good indicator for rain coming our way as soon as you start to see ants moving and going away from a nest carrying eggs and out and towards higher ground you know that we're going to have a situation where we're going to get a bit more rain coming our way right now our ants are still busy feeding and moving things around and so we'll probably leave them to do that as the sun starts to set in the meantime let's go back across to Bentley Smith who's still driving about and I think he's still hoping to bump into Hosanna well I've decided to give up on Hosanna for now uh, just the fact is I'm, I'm sure he's close by there but he's in that same block as the elephants and as I was saying I don't particularly feel like walking amongst uh, amongst the, that whole situation. So my brother told me that they had Hukumuri this morning heading east towards uh, our western boundary and no one really checked up there this morning so I think we're going to go have a shot straight up Philemon's cut line um, and then check that new road, Mendoza Road, to see if there we can find any sign of him in that area. So uh, he was seen heading east from Knobthorn Open, which is only about 100 meters away from our boundary. So it might be worth going to have a check in that area. The temperature is, is actually really pleasant at the moment. 
It's just dropped a little bit off that really hot period. It is a magic time of the evening. <laughs> oh, it's time for some language lessons for Eloise. Uh, Eloise <laughs> would like to know what does show mean in South African slang. Apparently I used it earlier. I don't even remember. Um, can be used in quite a few different um, uh, circumstances. It's S H double O or triple O or quadruple O, depending on how long you hold the show for. So uh, it's generally an uh, exclamation of surprise um, or shock. So you could say the Australians were caught ball tampering, and you could go, sure. So those of you who follow cricket will know in the news the Australians have just been caught being very naughty boys, um, cheating at the cricket. So when I found out that they were cheating at the cricket, I went, sure. So that's, that's one way you could use it. I'm not sure how I used it earlier, but uh, yes, that is, um, that is a, it's sort of an exp ex exclamation of surprise, sure. Not to be confused with shock, 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 shock. Uh, well, so I'm gonna try to get up towards the western areas before we lose the light. And while we do that, I'm hoping that Taylor's going to have some luck and those lions will start roaring early tonight to make sure the avocas keep heading to the north. Well, I'm glad that's all settled down now. <laughs> We're getting nervous. We had a very excited lion at one point. It was quite awkward, to be honest. Now, he, this male, whatever it may be, laying upside down like this, was um, yawning and rolling around. And I'm hoping that that was the first of many and that the next step is to actually sit up and show himself. I can't see if the other, one of the other males was sitting up for like two seconds, but there wasn't really a gap to get in there. But I think he's gone down now. I think he's gone completely flat, which is a pity. We'll see. There's another vehicle moving, so I'm just going to watch to see if there is any more movement with these lines. Now, where they'd go and drink? Oh, there we go. Oh, there's one. Hello. Moving in from the back. Oh, you limpy Lou. No, it looks like he's a bit limpy. Who's this? Tenyo. See that? Oh, a couple of scratches on the back right leg. Have you been fighting? Obviously, we couldn't see much of them this morning. Let me go up and go around the bend. Let's have a... Oi! Watch your heads, watch your hands. There we go. Two male lion. No, why'd you do that? That was unnecessary. I don't know who that was that got up, but he does have a couple of scratches on his back legs that didn't look particularly fresh to me. They actually look like they'd scarred and gone black already. And hopefully this other boy is going to walk into frame now too. I can see him sitting up, so that's good news. I think he may walk straight in this direction. It might be Nana. I don't know who we were looking at. Goodness, I, it's been a long time since I've seen the faces of a Birmingham, so you might have to help me. I know that Mfumo has a scar under his right eye. Is his right eye? Where he had uh, the attack of the myasis. Remember, one of the Mkuma lionesses swatted at him, and then unfortunately, the flies got in there and laid their eggs inside the wound. And um, and then basically it was a type of myasis where the the larvae of those flies actually feeds on on flesh and then ate a big hole in his face. But it healed up quite nicely. It was quite a cool thing to see in the wild. Unfortunate for him, for more. But we did all did learn a lot from that experience. Yay! Here he comes. And um, that's the easiest way. And he's got quite a sort of beaten up face as well. And then. Nana has got an equal sign on his nose. I think Tenyo is the one that's got the half moon taken out of his ear as well, as well as um, he uh, has got a big cut on his lip or from where, where he was in a bit of an argument. And you can see a part of his lip is missing. Come on. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. 
come to us, please. We've been waiting all patiently. Everybody's now left. Here he comes. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy. And then Nsuku's just got the most golden eyes and the most beautiful mane. Here we go. This is Nena that we've got. Beautiful equal sign on the right-hand side of his nose. Hi, gorgeous. That's a very pretty lion. They do look like they've got a few scratches on them, but like I said, it doesn't look fresh. So I don't know if they've maybe been in a couple of arguments, perhaps with even the females down a little bit further south from here. Remember, these boys have been roaming around down on Sabi Sabi. Um, they've been moving around up in Londolozi, Mala Mala. So yeah, crazy. Now, as we sit and hope that these lions are going to sit up and roar, and I think they may. I don't think that they're finished not, you know, announcing their presence that they've returned. And Wendy, uh, you've just asked that question basically about their roar. How, how, how far away can another lion hear its roar? Well, we as humans can hear a, a lion roar from about eight kilometers away. And that's with our very deaf ears. In comparison to a lion, it's hard to say. Uh, I reckon it'd be a couple of kilometers more than that because I can't tell you how many times you've heard, you've actually seen lions fast asleep like they were now and then sitting up, ears sort of pricked out, listening, quiet, quiet, and you can't hear a sound, not even a bird tweeting, you know, it'd be one of those quiet nights and next minute, those lions that you're watching that were fast asleep break out in a roar. And that's when you know that... Um, that something is, uh, they've obviously heard something. They must have heard other lions roaring in the distance. So I can't say exactly how far away. I mean, you'd be able to do a test if, if you had one pride of lions that was sitting 14 kilometers away and you, your mate was with another pride of lions and the one fella said, oh, my lions are roaring and the other guy said, oh, my lions have actually just popped their heads up. They're listening to something. You know, then you could be exact about a distance but we know eight kilometers is a human and I think it's a probably a few more kilometers than that which is was just quite cool and pretty amazing so like I said the Birminghams are known to do that they're known uh, to start roaring from quite a distance away I mean I'd be sitting up and I'd hear faint roars far 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 south from my bedroom and and in the DRC it's quite difficult to normally hear and um, the sounds are sort of can be distorted slightly because of obviously all the concrete walls around and you hear it gets closer and closer and it doesn't stop every 10 minutes a roar 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 till it, your windows are vibrating if you think they're going to fall out of the framing and I've had that a couple of times pretty cool when they come right past camp walk down past the cars so and then you carry on hearing that until it completely disappears. So they make a lot of noise, and especially now that they've smelt that the evoker males are here, whether or not they, they saw them or not, there was an interaction, we don't know. We, we can't say for sure until we see the evoker males. If they've all battered up and got scratches, well, then we know there was an altercation, and they probably won't come back for some time. But off you go to Tristan. The light is fading, but the bugs are still out and about. They are indeed. Now, this is a type of beetle that we see fairly regularly, and I still can't find a positive ID on it. I've tried to find many different examples of this beetle, and I've come close, but never found the exact one that we're looking at. And we find them, like I say, quite regularly on trees, certain bushes, and often on the car itself as well. And it's a small kind of black beetle, but when you get a bit of light onto it, it gets this coppery sheen to it, and it's very, very round, and small little antenna and small legs. It's almost a little kind of ladybug-like in structure, but it's not one of those, and I can't seem to find the exact beetle. I've tried numerous times, because we see them quite often. You see them a lot on some of the plants, particularly the sesbanios, we see them on there, and we also see them a little bit on the wattles, on the flowers, so I don't really know which beetle it is, but they are pretty cool little things. Now, I'll try and put my finger roughly in the area, I can't actually see where it is, oh there it is, so I'm going to put my finger there and just give you an idea of how large it is, also try and put the light a little bit better for Craig, but is that alright Craig, have you got my finger there? So that's my index finger that you've got, just in terms of a relative size between the beetle and me and they are very common in this area good well we are going to start making our way home there's a big storm coming there's lightning it's also starting to get a bit dark out here for walking around and so while we do that let's send you back across to brent who is still busy bumbling about well we're now on the opposite side of the property to where we've been and you can see there's the storm Tristan's talking about I don't think it's going to get to us though somehow it looks like it's going to go further down to the south but we are right here we're looking for 
Hokumuri now. Um, so this is the area where you might have crossed that Knobthorn open area is just or a little bit to the right of that termite mound through there. So that's where he's going to come from. And uh, so we're just having a quick look through here. As it gets dark, he might start getting on the move, start getting on the hunt or getting on the scent mark. Since we've been reminiscing, you know, about the old days. Then we're becoming Wenwees. Um, but uh, Sweet Peas asking about the coalition that came before the Birmingham boys. Uh, they were called the Matimbas. And you had Hairy, Berry, Hairy Belly Matimba and Ginger Matimba. Uh, there used to be, I think, four or five of them. But since I, I, when I arrived, there were only two of them. And they got chased by the Birminghams. They ended up down south in Londolozi and central Sabi Sands for a bit. I think they might have moved on to the next plane now. Um, but yeah, so it was the Matimba Mail Line Coalition. And they were already quite old. So, unlike the Birminghams, when the Birminghams came in, the Matimbas were sort of right down towards the end of their, their reign at the top. Uh, Whether is that these evokers have arrived while the Birminghams are still in prime condition. Well, it was, quite, it was really nice to see them this morning. They were looking spectacular. Hungry, but spectacular. Now, what was that disappearing there? Now, of course, the Inkahumas were bombshelled by the evokers a few nights ago, and uh, the little cub has, I think, been seen. Olivia was asking about that. I think it has been seen. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but so far, they've seen dribs and drabs of the Inkahumas to the west, all contact calling, trying to find each other, which, I mean, we've got to remember, when the Birminghams first arrived, that's what happened frequently as well. They would chase the Inkahumas and they would bomb shell in groups. The Birminghams even killed, I think it was two adult Inkahuma lionesses and a sub-adult uh, female. Uh, they killed that, that, that sub-adult female uh, right near Tristan's room when he was working at Sibambili. And uh, the Inkahuma female was killed in Torchwood at Second Rock and we actually got special permission to go into Torchwood. Did you come with me, Viam? It was Andrew. Andrew came with me. We got special permission to go into Torchwood to actually go film that carcass. Now, of course, there were five Birminghams in the beginning. Uh, one male died from injuries received from a buffalo horn in the lung. Punk looked like he had a punctured lung. Quite quiet here in the west. Well, it seems like Tristan's having lots of fun with flutterbys this afternoon. Let's go see what he's found now. We are indeed. So we've managed to find another one. Craig somehow managed to spot this guy hidden in the plants because it is really very well camouflaged. It's got this kind of similar sheen to it that the leaves do. And so an African vagrant that is just sitting. It's actually quite a white, creamy colored butterfly, but with my lights on and the greens around it, it's almost reflecting that green color and blending in a lot better. But you can see that nice big eye, those antenna, and a very cool view of a butterfly. Now, because it's getting quite dark, and I'm using my lights just to try and highlight it a little bit for you. You can see that the butterflies are far more relaxed than they were earlier in the day. We were struggling earlier, they were hyperactive, they were flying, they were moving all over the place. Whereas now, we're sitting, I don't even know, Craig's probably maybe 20 cent, not even, 15 centimeters from that butterfly and it's just sitting dead still as it tries to now camouflage for the night. And you'll find that these guys do this, they find a plant and they get into a good position where they're able to then spend the evening and relax. But isn't that beautiful? I think it's a very pretty butterfly. 
very common here we see them regularly flying across the road all over the place and you can see those beautiful veins on the wings and big wing structure with that upturned head very very cool to see so well spotted Craig that's a very good job it is a very pretty little butterfly and I said it's quite big actually I'll try and give you a size reference so that you can all see without disturbing it but if I put my hand there hopefully it's not going to fly away they'll give you an idea of just how kind of big it is in comparison to my hand so one of the larger butterflies that we see in this particular section much larger sorry I'm trying to find a way to get a better light on it much larger than any of the others that we have seen this afternoon so far good it is getting very dark now like I say we're trying to use a light in order to <laughs> highlight that butterfly so while we kind of get head off home and avoid the rain and head back to camp let's send you across to Taylor with the Birmingham boys and hopefully they're going to give an almighty roar this evening something because all three of them jolted up as if they were zapped by some electricity I can't hear anything but they literally look sort of west from where we are. Now they're looking up north. Well, Nana's still... F oh, there's a line. Is there your line? I thought I heard something far away. Like a contact call. But if they have picked up the scent of the Avoca males, they are going to be on high alert to any other lions that are moving through the area. There we go, big yawn. Oh, a trio of yawns. Very nice. Who's that? Is that a Fumo in the middle? With that very swollen face? I actually can't tell the difference between them anymore. Is it? Or is that Tinyo? No, uh, that looks like a Fumo, eh? What do you think, Darby? You're going to all have to help me, everybody, but, you, but you're better at identifying the animals than I am. Like I said, I've not been here for a very long time and have forgotten these cats and what they look like. Okay, hashtag Safari Live, but definitely Nana closest to us. Perhaps in Suku at the back? No, that lion looks like it's got a chip on its ear. I also think it's in Suku. Lou thinks it's in Suku. In Siku, listen to me, in Suku. Sad, like a terrible South African. But again, these boys look so different. They all have definitely got a few more scars on their face since I last saw them, which is, of course, normal, considering considering sorry that they've been roaming around out of their home turf. What is wrong with my English? Yeah, that's in Suku. Those eyes don't lie. Golden eyes. And then I think it's in Fumo. Maybe it's Tinyo that's not here. It's quite interesting, but we'll wait for confirmation from all of you. Lion IDing experts. I don't want to mess it up. So it couldn't have been anything too serious because you saw how they put their heads back down very quickly and I think they're going to wake up soon. Let's hope that they just keep moving further south and not north or east. Now, something that I've never seen, of course, is different coalitions of lions joining up with one another except two single lions and Paula you've asked us that have I ever seen something like that I haven't but we can pass it on to Brent and Tristan who have also been guiding for an exceptionally long time and worked in a variety of different areas the only time I've ever seen it was when two older male lions on their own each on their own joined up and Freddie and Solo um, which were both lions that sort of came from Kruger and popped into the Sabi Sa in the southwestern corner around there so, so those are the only two, but they sort of came together as retirement. They weren't actively going out, marking, defending territories and mating with females. They are just sort of trying to stay alive and to keep out of the way of the younger uh, upstarts. Because, of course, they would love to beat down on some old, old male lions. Probably be good for their ego, not so good for the older boys. And they were, they were old males. So that's the only other time I've seen it. But otherwise, no, I haven't seen it before. It does occasionally happen, though. Again, Brent had a... Um, a sighting where a single male lion in Kenya tried to join a, a coalition, but it didn't work. They denied him and actually had a big scrap with him. He was lucky to get away with the scratches that he had. 
Uh, it's quite interesting, but I sh I'm sure it depends on the circumstances, but things like that can indeed happen. Like I said, I'm not surprised by anything that happens in the bush anymore. Not surprised. Uh, it, it, it's so crazy how things can sort of happen here. Here's a big roll. Now, big stretches. These boys obviously chomped down on a buffalo this morning. Must have been a small one that they caught because they barely seem to have subsided substantially since we last saw them. And Elizabeth, you've just asked if these cats will ever eat other cats. Uh, I've never seen lions doing it before. Uh, they're not typically cannibalistic, so they don't necessarily eat other lions. Uh, I suppose out of pure desperation, if they're starving, they might eat a leopard if they catch one. Uh, what I have seen, though, is a documentary, and I can't remember what it was called, where a very old male lion, a very sad story, I've told this story to you before, actually goes out and um, catches a sleeping hyena and then eats the hyena. Which uh, He was actually just purely desperate. He was starving to death. And then a few days later, he came across a buffalo that was stuck in the mud. And he desperately tried to kill it, but he was just so weak that he couldn't even tear through the hide of that buffalo. So his days had come and gone. It was quite sad and quite ironic that the two of them died together in the same mud wallow. Prey and predator. It was quite hectic. It was one of old documentary. I don't think it was Eternal Enemies. I don't know what it was. But long, it was from a long, long, long time ago. So I've never seen anything like that. But again, when desperation comes around, these animals are not going to say no just because the book says that I don't do it. And so I say, you, you can't actually ever be surprised about what these animals get up to. Well, they've gone slightly more flat again, hopefully not for too long. Hopefully they're going to wake up and uh, maybe give us a roar. But off you go across to Brent to see if he's had any luck with finding Hosanna. There has been almost apps. Well, there's been no luck at the side. It's been very quiet. Uh, no tracks. And uh, the only animal we've seen down in the southwest has been a single diker. True story. But it is that time of the day when stuff is about to start happening. Though it's still a little bit too light to whip out the spotlight. There's still enough ambient light around that I can see. Now, Taylor was answering a question from Paula about male lions joining up with other male lion coalitions. Uh, it, it, there's a very narrow window when that, that happens. You can have two males and two males that will join together, but that is in that sort of three to five year, <clears throat> probably, probably it's no, probably no longer than a year and a half or two years where, where, where those lines will be able to join in, into a coalition. After that and after those coalitions are established, uh, there's very little chance another male uh, can actually join. I've actually never heard of any. Now, the strangest terms, I suppose you could you could almost say it was a different coalition uh, joining a coalition, and it's only ever been recorded once, and that was in the Mara, was the Notch Boys. So there was um, were there four or five Notch children, I can't remember. I think there were f five, four, four Notches. And uh, what happened is that, strange enough, the Musketeers, Scar, Hunter, Morani, Osiku uh, moved in and chased Notch, and there was only one Notch, big male Notch left, and he used to lord over the Marsh Pride and and uh, the Mara River Pride and that area around the Musiara Marsh, and till the Musketeers came along, and uh, he sp he split, but he left with. It was five, it was five. He left with his five young boys. So that's never been recorded and they formed another coalition and it enabled Notch Senior to, to survive a lot longer and, 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 and take over another pride even after he was at a, he was at a, he was, he was senior, uh, at a senior age, uh, was able to, to, to survive a little bit longer and mate, mate for a bit longer with other females. And as far as I'm aware, that's the only case um, of that being recorded. I'm not saying it's never happened in the history of lions before, but that's the only case where it's actually been recorded by people. I'm sure lots of stuff that we would think was completely out of this world has happened. There just hasn't been anyone there to record it. Ah, 
right now, since we are on a male lion coalitions, probably the most famous male lion coalition to have graced the Sabi signs was the Mapojo males. And uh, Randy Allen says, have you seen all of, all of them? I did. I saw them when there were six of them. Most people think there were five, but there used to be six Mopohos. And uh, I saw them first when they were about three and a half years old. I was at Singita, and I just had a dinner, and I was walking back to my room. And um, being a new staff member, I was living in the, in the, in the ranger trainee camp, which was called Roybos. Um, and all the tents were named after T's. Very strange. Don't know why you would have to do that, but uh, and uh, it was about 100 meters from the car garages off in the bush. And as I was walking there with my torch, I suddenly encountered six male lions in my way to my bed. So I had to go back and get a vehicle to drive back to my tent that night. And then I spent a lot of time with them um, over the years. So I actually spent most of my time with Singita in the Kruger up against the Labombo Mountains. Uh, with the mountain pride, which is another big pride of lions. But uh, then when I was at Londolozi, it was at sort of the height of the Mopojo's reign over the central uh, Sabi Sands. Uh, I've seen all five of them take down a buffalo together. I've seen them take down a giraffe as well. So, yes, I have seen all, all, all of those male lions. And uh, for those of you who don't know what Mopojo means and why they were called the Mopojo, um, so to the north of us here, and actually it eventually ended up here, there was a security company that was formed by the local community themselves called the Mopojos. And they got quite a reputation for being very brutal, um, particularly with um, people who were offended in the rural communities. They would just take them out. And uh, they were very aggressive and used to use some tactics that were not very nice in terms of dealing with criminals in their communities. So that's where the Mopojo have got their name from. Now, for those of you, I'm going to tell you a story that you will think was straight out of a horror film about the Mopojo males. Now, Mr. T was uh, one of the Mopojo males who had a bit of a mohawk, hence his nickname. Um, we, uh, that was what they called him up here in the north. We actually called him something else different at Blondelosi. Uh, the trackers called him Satan, or Satan. And the reason they called him Satan was because of this particular day. So, what happened was, is there were Ottawa Pride. One of the Ottawa Pride females uh, had been pulled across by some of the other Mopojos and one of them was mating with her and Mr. T ran in, killed her, mated with her corpse while she was dead and then proceeded to eat almost every inch of her. So the guys up here in the north used to call her Mr. T but all of us down south uh, all, all of us, all of us who worked with our, our trackers and stuff who saw that, our trackers immediately said uh -uh. That lion is Satan. Satan. So, strangely enough, um, they were very aggressive male lions with with um, with other lions. They killed quite a lot of females and a lot of other males. However, when you used to walk them on foot, they were not very scary at all. They, I don't think I ever got charged by a mapojo once, and I've probably walked them well over 50, 60 times on foot, maybe even more than that. And I never got charged by a Mopojo once. I got charged by Tsalala females, I got charged by, I even got charged by the Shores males who were there before the Mopojo. But anyway, um, yeah, so it was quite strange. They were pretty chilled on foot and they didn't really give you too much revs, they'd rather run away. But I'm gonna see if we can find anything. You know what I haven't seen since I've been back as a bush baby? That's what I wanna see tonight. Uh, or an owl. In the meantime, let's go see how Taylor's lions are doing. Look at what we've got up in the sky. It's a moon that is slowly starting to disappear because of the cloud cover. And I've also spotted the odd flash of lightning in the distance. And again, something has drawn the attention of the lions in the north. Maybe it is. Maybe it's the evoker males. Perhaps they're calling in the far distance. 
and who knows if these Birminghams will go charging on afterwards. So I believe that you all think that the lion in the middle is Tenyo. Awesome. I trust you on this one. If he rolls over and he shows his mangy belly, then we um, will, of course, well, can confirm it. Well, that's how I normally identify him because him and Mfumo have the most swollen faces. And to me, they look quite similar, especially after such a long stint away. And Angela, well done for being the first one. In fact, to get all three of the IDs correct, that's fantastic news. It really is. Come on, boys. Give us a big old roar. I mean, that's what we're going to be after this evening. Like I said to you, it's been a long time since I've had lions roaring right next to my car. And I don't know if Maurice the elephant has actually had a decent lion roaring sighting. He's actually changed his outfit, David. Look at this. He's become a ninja elephant now. Amazing. He got dressed and ready and hoped that the lions would roar for him. So he's like a karate kid. You can see. He's now he's got his scarf. It's too hot to wear a scarf. So he's tied it around his head. Do you think he can do moves? <laughs> Behave. We're in a lion sighting. Can't be doing karate in front of male lions. Now, I was supposed to think about this, but I got distracted. And ma Magic Dragon Lizard, love the name, by the way. That's great. Very creative. You've asked, what is the, um, what is my most, what is it again? What is my most entertaining? Funniest thing I've ever seen a lion do. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Nikki. I know you told me to think about it earlier, and then I forgot. What is the funniest thing I've seen a lion do? Oh, I, I don't even know where to begin. My favorite part is when they climb up into trees, the youngsters, and then fall out of them. That's always uh, quite entertaining. Oh, watching a young lion try and climb a tree and go all the way up and go, Oh, this is easy. Watching them come down is hysterical. All the lions, and we've got a bit more experience, obviously. I'm better at doing it, but the youngsters are, are are really not well equipped at climbing just yet until they've learned where they need to put their feet. Um, oh, <laughs> back in the Eastern Cape, down on the southeast coast of South Africa, I've also told this story before, but I'll never forget it. There was a pride of lions and the most beautiful male lion. Remember I showed you those pictures of Mondoro and, um, and the beautiful black mane Kalahari lion? And there was a huge puddle on the road, basically a, along the fence line. They were walking, and there were thick shrubs on the other side of the road. And this puddle had completely covered the road, and it was quite deep, probably more than ankle deep. <clears throat> Anyways, the pride of lions and the cubs all walked through it. Some of them leapt over it. And this big male lion got to the water's edge, stopped, put his paw in, and sort of took it out and shook it, kind of like what a cat does, and then walked, turned around, and he must have done a big three, four hundred meter loop <laughs> to get around it. He was not putting his feet in the water. So looking at a big, strong male lion and seeing him being put off by a puddle of water was particularly funny too. And um, the other thing that was quite funny was a lion defecating next to one of the vehicles and then that vehicle trying to leave the sighting and driving through the dung and then getting slightly stuck and tires spinning and the dung going onto the side of another car and their guests. Indirectly, but quite hilarious. <laughs> the other vehicle was not impressed. So, um, so I've seen a couple of funny things. I'm pretty sure I could think of some more if I actually just put my head down and, uh, and thought about it. But um, yes, the cats are entertaining. It's very quiet out tonight. Hmm. Goodness, Tino, you might be the first one to get up with all those yawns. He's starting to groom himself. Now, obviously these lions have got big, beautiful manes. And something that I do a lot is my hair sheds all the time. I'm often referred to as either a German Shepherd or a, a Labrador, the rate at which I lose hair. And First Lady has asked, do the male lions lose their manes as they get older? I haven't really noticed that. Um, I haven't noticed any hair loss, you know, any bald spots forming on the male lion. So I don't think that that really does happen. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Again, we can ask Brent and Tristan, but I don't think, well, Tristan's not driving anymore. Tristan's gone back to camp because it's dark now and we don't want him walking around. But I don't think that that happens. Um, well, not to an extent where I've ever noticed. And I've seen some very old male lions before. He's very interested in whatever is in the north. Could be a Pride of lioness. Maybe it's in Guma Pride that are coming back. Maybe they're contact calling for one another. 
because from my understanding, it seems as though that the Nkuhuma Pride are quite split up at the moment. I don't think they've all been seen together. I mean, that's probably because the evokers were around and caused a bit of a stir um, and, and uh, scattered. Ooh, seven minutes and 15 seconds for these lions to roar for us. Come on, boys. Just one. We just need one to start, and then the rest should start chiming in. And at the moment, the most promising one looks like it's going to be Tenure. <laughs> now, if they do roar, I'll tell you right now, I'll get goosebumps because the whole vehicle start vibrating. The sound is just amazing, and it, it does send a couple of chills down your your spine. It's a pretty cool thing, especially in such close proximity. Now, I've completely forgot who's just asked this question. Sorry, Nikki. <laughs> Topical, hey? Ever. Do the lions ever scare anybody when they roar? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> I wonder. I don't know. Anybody in camp in FC, anybody in final control get nervous when the lions roar? I, I bet when they roar, when they're right outside camp, like I said, and the, the windows start to vibrate, that's an intimidating sound. <clears throat> I think the first time you ever hear a lion roar, it's probably a bit on the intimidating side. But again, the adrenaline is rushing through you. It's a, it's sort of, you feel confused. You don't quite know what your body is feeling. It's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to describe. You have to just experience it for yourself. So, so I think initially, especially anybody that comes from the city and has never been out into the African wilderness before, then yes, definitely. And I reckon the impala must panic it every now and then too, or the buffalo, when they hear those sounds going, oh no, that means they're probably going to be up and on the move. I'd be a bit nervous if I was a prey species archer at night and in the dark. Sounds like the fiery neck night jars have also just started calling too. Right, we're going to sit on tight and hold our breaths. Well, maybe we shouldn't hold our breaths for that long. Um, <clears throat> and hope that, of course, these lions are going to roar. Let's go and see what Brent is going to pull out of his hat next. Uh, I'm just having a drink of water, nothing out of my hat just yet. But I'm checking some of my favorite bush baby hangouts. I haven't seen a bush baby since I've been back out. I've seen them in, at Inga's house, but not out and about. Um, and there's all, almost always a good chance just around the old bush prize site. Now, I know a lot of you are probably wondering about the fate of that poor elephant um, who's got some of his intestines hanging out. Um, so it's been reported to uh, the Parks Board in Pumalanga Parks. Uh, they will be coming through in the morning to assess that animal and it will be up to them what decision is made. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you because I'm not that type of person. I think most likely, um, the most likely decision that will be happening with that animal is it will be euthanized. Now, just because of the high density of people in in this area uh, and safari lodges and bushwalk and tracking and all that type of stuff uh, it poses a very very serious threat um, to anyone while on safari or specifically when you're on foot now the the thing is he's fine now it's a fresh wound he's sore but you could see he was completely relaxed around the vehicle um, and so the, the problem will come in in about a week or so, maybe even shorter with this very hot weather um, where that wound gets infected and it's almost certainly going to get infected because the intestine is punctured and you could see um, blood and his, 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 his dung was really runny so you could see that already so the infection would set in and the fever firstly that would cause the animal a huge amount of pain Secondly, it now makes that animal extremely dangerous. Now, if this had been in an area in the far northern Kruger somewhere where the tourists don't go and a section water had found it, he probably would have left it. Uh, but but because, because it is in an area where we operate constantly all the time, uh, it, it, it does make sense. And, and as I said, I don't want to lie to you. He, that elephant is not going to be fine and it is very very sad and I feel very sorry and it's never easy to see that type of stuff but if we think about it uh, logically 
uh, it's it's probably it's it's safer for everyone and a lot more comfortable for the elephant if he's what was that um, if he is euthanized um, because dying from septicemia uh, whoopsie it's a little stand bulky I thought it would look like a little kitty cat I don't want to put the lights on a little stand bulky um, if he dies from septicemia or, or even pulled apart by hyenas in in a in a, in a, it'll probably be two weeks or so. It's going to be a far, far worse death for him. So I think probably the, the, as I say, I can't be sure. It's not my decision to make, but I think logically, that is the decision that is going to be made um, when the parks get here tomorrow. And I think that's best for all parties involved, the elephant, and all of us who have to, who live and work out here on a daily basis.